Okay, we're all here. Um, we have um, actually already called the meeting to order and done the roll call. All council members are present, as is Assistant Village Manager um, Melissa Dodd, um, our clerk Judy Kintner. We have isolated Patty Bates, our village manager, <laughs> over in the side of the room because she may or may not um, have an infection of some sort. <laughs> Nothing that's going to get over to you guys, though. Um, and our, our uh, police chief and our solicitor, Chris Conard. Um, and we did have an executive session starting at 5.30 for the purpose of the evaluation of a public official and discussion of potential litigation. So we will now begin regular session. And the first uh, matter of business is swearing in of our new police chief. And we have Mayor Fobert here to do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Come on up here. Oh, well, sure. Bring Shin. on up. Shin. Shin. Okay. This is deja vu all over again. Yes, isn't it? it is. <laughs> well, I'm real happy. Me too. I couldn't be happier, believe me. You've done a tremendous job as the interim chief, and it just shows dramatically within the personnel and the community appreciation of all that you've done and will continue to do. Now, I hope that you outlast me in the number of years that you serve as chief. I will finish up 26 years and two months in 1st of January when I retire as being mayor. And I want you at least 26 years and three months. <laughs> Will that work for you? Maybe half of that. Uh, well, if we could have half, we'll take it. Thank you. All right. I want to swear you in, Brian. And I would you rather use swear or affirm? Either or. Okay. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. That I will support, support the Constitution that I will support the Constitution and will obey the laws of the United States and will obey the laws of the United States and the state of Ohio and the state of Ohio that I will in all respects that I will in all respects observe the provisions of the Charter observe the provisions of the Charter and ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs and ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs and faithfully will discharge the duties of office and faithfully will discharge the duties of office of the chief of police. Of the chief of police. Amen, brother. This is a very happy moment. Thank you oh. both. Thank you, Chief. Um, we are very happy to have you on board officially and for as long as you are able to be here. And uh, we wish you well and um, are very happy of what you've already done um, for the department, as, as the mayor said. And I want to thank council for all your input on uh, see the Brian is here, and especially to Patty who made the ultimate decision. Right. And I think that was the finest decision that she has made in her tenure here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mayor Fobert. Thanks, Mayor. I don't know who gets those. Okay. You get Judy gets those. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> you get them both, right? You get, okay. Come out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, next uh, on the agenda are announcements uh, from Council. Um, I will start with a couple. Um, the Chamber has a business after hours this uh, Thursday, the 22nd. It's a little bit different date than usual. Um, it is out at Stony Creek Garden Center. Um, 
so we're very excited at, uh, to open up that new business and, and uh, they're excited to see us all come out and it's obviously the growing season so go out see what they have they've got a lot of natives they have a new building out there they are really anxious to work with local with local um, residents on their um, garden and landscaping needs um, and then coming up on July 8th is Springs Fest. It's an all-day music festival that will be here at the Bryan Center. And um, there's a great group of, of musicians uh, performing. It starts at noon, and I think it's over at about 10. All right. Brian? Um, Marianne, do you want to talk oh. about this Saturday? Yeah. Well, I was fortunate to be able to go to the Columbus Pride event on Saturday, <laughs> where I snagged these things. Um, <laughs> So Yellow Springs is having its Gay Pride event this Saturday. Starts at noon uh, right here at the Bryan Center. So, well, it's, out. yeah, yes. I mean the, the parade's at five. So, so the event is yeah. out here with music and beer garden, beer garden, and some vendors, I believe. And then the the sidewalk parade starts at five. Right, leaving okay. from here. And then they go to the Little Art at what time? Uh, they will end there at six, and I'm sure there'll be some dancing in the streets before the Ruby Girls. Oh, well, no? on the sidewalks? Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> We're keeping it confined to the sidewalks this year. Okay. Um, and then the Ruby Girls will also be at Peaches to uh, wrap up the great day. All right. Um, yeah, so actually Thursday is super busy. Um, uh, Antioch College is having their Colloquia Humanities Arts Gala. Um, also, uh, the uh, fire station is going to be supporting a, um, or hosting a fundraiser at the brewery uh, to raise funds for the uh, stair climb. And um, the Yellow Springs Kids Playhouse uh, starts this Thursday, and they'll be running for two weekends. Uh, yeah, I'm a very proud uncle. I've got a nephew in that show, so uh, it's going to be exciting. And um, I also wanted to mention uh, June 28th, uh, we have talked about the second CBE community conversation. We have confirmed that that will be here in council chambers, and that's going to be from 7 to 9, and we've decided on a panel format. So we'll have... Uh, several folks talking about the covenants, about um, some of the other aspects of development um, that's both current and planned in the village and other things that sort of relate to um, uh, that property. And then I was asked to read that during the week of June 26, 26th, village staff will be exercising valves in preparation for making connections to the new water plant. Villagers may experience brown water during this time, please direct any question to the village manager's office, which is 767-1279. Right, that's it. Great. Oh, Jerry? Is that Jerry? Do you have something? Oh, yes. Um, I, I see we're not having a discussion on the agenda, but myself, uh, Chief Carlson, and Johnny Burns from uh, uh, Electric and Water had a great opportunity for a 10-hour ride to the back <laughs> Juliet, Illinois, to take a look at the uh, medical marijuana uh, facilities. And, and I think the Chief and Johnny can also speak to it, but we were very impressed with the two facilities we saw. One, one of the facilities was a, a um, greenhouse type facility, and then the other was a totally artificially lighted. Uh, facility and uh, from the time we initially uh, we gained access to the facility until the time we, we left uh, the staff and folks there were very cordial and we did ask some very tough questions and uh, I think the three of us were very satisfied with the answer so you know if this happens to go forward I think the community is going to be very impressed with the type of operation that they have. Great thanks Jerry. Um, anybody else announcements? Okay we'll move on to uh, the consent agenda. Um, I would like to pull the meeting or the minutes of the June 5th meeting because I did have a few um, substantive changes that I would like to make. Chris, do we just pull that out and then do a consent agenda? How do we do that? 
pull it out make the changes or just so do the consent agenda for the two that are on there okay so can i get a motion to approve the minutes of may 23rd special meeting and the may financials so moved second aye. all those in favor signify by saying aye aye um then we'll go through the the june 5th minutes um i'll go through page by page just because that's the way we used to do it and i'll pick up the comments that i had page one page two um, what I have on page two about right in the middle, um, the um, in re under reading of resolution 2017-27, it was um, about the visit, site visit, and two council members, Housh and Wintrow, were mentioned. I would also like to include that village manager Patty Bates and um, zoning, um, whatever mm -hmm. Denise's planning and zoning administrator, Denise Swinger, were also in attendance. Page three, page four, page five, page six. Again, in the middle, um, under old business, in the discussion about the um, letter to the township and school board, the um, sentence begins, Wintrow noted that the school board is deep in the discussion. It says regarding affordability, it's really regarding facilities, okay. not affordability. Mm -hmm. Um, page seven, um, down somewhat close to the middle, um, the sentence believes in answer to a question from McQueen, the last part of that mentions Cedarville, and it says which does have a newer tax. Actually, Cedarville doesn't have a lodging tax. And then at the bottom, it appears to me that it, Dodd stated this, that the tax appears applicable only to establishments, and then there's a period. It appears that that's an incomplete thought. I am. Oh, no, know. as opposed to just in home operations. Okay. <clears throat> okay, that was the way it was stated. I realize it's a little vague, but that was the statement. Okay. That's, that's fine then. So that's all I had. Anybody else? Can I get a motion to approve? So approve. moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Uh, moving on to a review of the agenda. We do have a new, an updated agenda on the table, Council. Is there anything that uh, we want to change or remove? Um, I will make a note, let's see if it's under, under the Home Inc. presentation, it will actually not be about the Cemetery Street project. It will be about um, a new project. And I noticed that Emily is here to discuss that. Um, I wanted to ask that we put time frames on each discussion. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you thought about the time frame. Well, and I actually, well, we did. I think that's actually something that oh, was it added. was added in. I see that yes. it's added in Thank now. Thank you, yes. Judy, okay. since I didn't think about it. Oh no, she's the person that thought about it and said you should do that. Yes. Um, okay, so I think <laughs> that that sh hopefully that um, looks pretty good. The other thing I wanted to that uh, I wondered if we could put under new business just as an introduction during our goals discussion, um, I had raised the idea of. Uh, developing best practices for the village regarding the higher uh, diversity or hiring a diverse workforce and um, I'm not sure what happened to it in the goals discussion but um, I wondered if we could just have a short item under new business on that sure looks like we actually have a even though we've been here since 530 it's, it's yeah it's a wide agenda shorter agenda so yep. anything else that we want to change or add Okay, hey, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications that were in our packet? Yes. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> Marianne and I submitted the uh, draft guidelines for uh, village policing, um, which will be a, a discussion item for our next meeting, uh, but everyone's got plenty of time to look at that. Um, and. Uh, think about any comments or feedback. Uh, we also received a letter from uh, Carl Champney about the lodging tax, which he basically supports, and he suggested some things about details, which we're actually going to resolve um, related to the law later today. Um, Henry Myers submitted a short letter 
that he asked to be read, so I'm going to read that. Dear council members, my understanding is that during last meeting, when affordability was being discussed, small houses and apartments for seniors were mentioned. I would rather Yellow Springs not become a Florida. Might I suggest small condos and apartments for single parents? Thank you. Um, and then we had a, um, well, something that we just got on the table, which was a letter from Holm Inc. Um, and uh, the upshot is talking about the uh, Glen Cottages pro project and uh, requesting some kind of waiver of tap and zoning fees. I think that's it. Okay. Um, moving on to public hearings and legislation. Karen, I, oh, I just me. wanted to ask, can we put, as we had been doing before citizen concerns, going back to the agenda <coughs> question, the report, the staff report. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, resolution 2017-29, I think we can read this in by title only. Okay, this is authorizing the village manager to submit an application to the Ohio Public Works Commission for the Winter Street Stormwater Drainage Project. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, Patty? Um, as council knows, um, the Ohio Public Works Commission opens um, a grant cycle every year that's normally due at the end of July. Um, this year, Jason Hamby has asked to submit a uh, drainage, stormwater drainage improvement project on Winter Street. Um, I believe it's between Cliff and Pre uh, Pleasant. Um, and that is what you see in front of you. Uh, the application that we're planning to submit would be 51% uh, village funds and 49% um, grant. If we are awarded the grant, the money would become available July 1 of next year um, to do this project. Great. I, I know that this is a project that um, citizens have been very concerned about for a long time. So I think it's uh, it's a good project to be considering. What what's exactly the problem that it's addressing? <coughs> There, uh, the embankment is very steep there because the road over the years has been built up and up, so the property uh, properties are significantly lower than the uh, crown of the road. And so the water generally washes down and stays down on the properties. And we're going to improve the drainage uh, along the sidewalk there with uh, some uh, graded drains that will keep the gravel out but allow the water to drain better for the properties. I would assume that stormwater projects are looked upon pretty favorably by OPWC? Yes, they're, um, they're part of the SCIP, Small Community Improvement Fund, um, that you can get um, funding for. It's one of the two forms that OPWC has funding for. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I guess I'm going to abstain. Okay. Uh, next is uh, resolution 2017-30. Would you um, read that in, in full, Judy? <clears throat> yes. Whereas council has reviewed the performance of the village manager in accordance with the terms of her employment agreement, and whereas council has determined that based on the village manager's performance, retaining the services of Patty Bates as village manager is in the continued best interests of the village, and whereas council has determined that an increase in the village manager's salary is warranted, now therefore council for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, the employment agreement with an effective date of July 7, 2017, is hereby amended as indicated. Section 2, Patty Bates is further awarded the annual employee wage adjustment in the amount of 2%, effective January 1st, 2017. Can I get a motion? So moved. Second. So obviously we're, we, had, we had Patty's evaluation, review and evaluation earlier. Um, council is, is very happy with her work, very happy with the way things are progressing in the village and um, getting a lot of projects done. We've got a lot, we're looking at a lot in the future. Patty's also looking towards uh, towards retirement in a couple of years, so um, it's um, we're probably going to push a lot on her in the last in the last two years of her. <laughs> Sorry, Patty. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. We didn't tell you that, did we? Um, any other? Any? 
No, just thank you, Patty, for uh, your patience and, and also the fact that you uh, are so good at engaging the community. Um, you know, I, we appreciate that you talk to everybody that comes to your door. Great. Thanks. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, resolution 2017-31. Um, I like this one. I don't know if we want to read it in by full, but that's all. It's also what most of the people sitting here are here to hear. So, do you think we should read it in in full? Yes. Go ahead and read it in in full. Okay. This is declaring support for the Paris Climate Agreement. Whereas consensus exists among the world's leading climate scientists that global warming caused by emission of greenhouse gases from human activities is among the most significant problems facing the world today, and whereas documented impacts of global warming include but are not limited to increased occurrences of extreme weather events, for example droughts and floods, adverse impacts on ecosystems, demographic patterns, and economic value chains, and whereas responding to climate change provides communities an opportunity to function more effectively and economically in a world unquestioningly impacted by this reality, and whereas the Paris Climate Agreement resulted in a commitment from almost every nation to take action and enact programs to limit global temperature increase, now therefore Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby resolves that. Section 1, Council indicates its commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions through continued support for the ongoing work of the Environmental Commission and the Energy Board in their production and in implementation of a climate action plan. Section 2, Council hereby joins 12 U.S. states, other U.S. communities, and businesses, including Xylem, located in Yellow Springs, in the Climate Mayor's Network in adopting and supporting the goals of the Paris Agreement. Section 3, Council hereby commits to exploring the potential benefits and costs of adopting policies and programs that promote the long-term goal of greenhouse gas emission reduction while maximizing economic and social co-benefits of such, such actions. Section 4, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs is committed to the health and safety of village residents and considers these actions in keeping with that commitment. Section 5, this resolution will be in effect immediately upon adoption. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, discussion? Um, yeah, Mary Ann? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to say. So, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, mothers out front mm -hmm. for um, sending the resolution to, uh, council, to village council, um, which we adapted just a bit. To, well, basically to include xylem, which is a local industry. But I wanted to let people know, in case you didn't know, that the village is working on developing a climate action plan. And this is something that we've talked about for a couple years. A group of us visited Oberlin a couple years ago. They have such a plan. Um, this The plan is being shepherded, the, the, the main person, uh, put, working on this is Deward Headley. Uh, this is the Environmental Commission. Uh, it's coming out of the Environmental Commission. We are wanting to work with the Energy Board. We're wanting to work with any other groups or individuals on this plan. So, so far, the plan has uh, sections that include electricity, how to, um, how, well, it's actually energy, how to increase uh, renewable sources of electricity in particular. It includes transportation. It includes waste reduction, solid waste reduction, water and wastewater, buildings, and then another um, sort of catch-all strategy called cross-cutting strategies, which include uh, carbon sequest sequestration, yeah. Yes. Um, local food production, things like that. So we're really on the, we have the outline of the plan, but we're very much looking for individuals and groups with expertise and or interest in, you know, doing something to work on the plan. The plan will then include uh, things that village government can do, things that businesses can do, and things that individuals can do. And there may very well be, since these are mothers who most of the kids are probably at Mills Lawn or the high school, potentially there could be some PBL projects yeah. wrapped up into some of this work too. Um, I had a conversation with Christine Reedy okay, uh, from the Mothers Out Front. Um, and uh, after having a meeting of the Energy Board, uh, which of course supports this declaration, um, one of the things that it 
the Energy Board member pointed out is, you know, it's great to declare support for the Paris Climate Agreement, but the Paris Climate Agreement actually requires things of our community, which, you know, Marianne was referencing there, measurable energy reductions. And um, the Energy Board's been a little stymied by how to get beyond the kind of the preaching to the choir about energy reduction. And so um, one thing I was hoping, uh, Karen, is that maybe somebody from the Mothers Out Front could, could um, you know, talk to us for a couple minutes and just have an opportunity to say to the public what they're doing, you know, to, so that people know about them and know how, who might want to participate. But the Energy Board was very encouraged with the idea that this, um, you know, group uh, would have be maybe more capable of doing greater outreach than they've been real successful at, as I say, beyond the people who have already kind of committed. And um, so, you know, so that's my hope. Um, but I was wondering if maybe somebody could Laura? speak to, yeah. yeah. Actually, several of us, I think, want to say something. Okay. Okay. Um, so my name is Laura Skidmore. I've met almost everyone on council. Um, and I'm here on behalf of my daughters. I have two daughters, a, a two, almost three-year-old named Charlotte and an 11-year-old named Gabriella. Um, and I'm here and I'm involved in Mothers Out Front because our children really have very little to no economic or political influence in our world. But this is the world that they are going to inherit from us. So I am here doing this work to help them on their behalf. Um, they're relying on us to make responsible decisions for them. Uh, Mothers Out Front started in Massachusetts in 2013. A group of moms who got together to find out more about climate change and what they could do about it. It's since then expanded uh, to currently 19 states. Um, and we are the first team in Ohio. We brought it here. We're the pioneers in this state. And our whole goal is to have a swift, but also a just, a fair transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. Because that's the only way that we're going to have a livable planet for our kids. And they are the ones who are going to suffer the consequences or the benefits, reap the benefits from whatever decisions we make. Uh, so. We have uh, meetings twice a month, our organizing team. The, the core has meetings twice a month that anyone's welcome to come to. So people who are interested could come to those meetings and just need to contact me um, for more information about those. And we, then we have other smaller groups that do specific tasks. Um, and any amount of time is welcome. You don't have to have a lot of time and to get involved in it. We're very flexible. Uh, so I urge Council obviously to urge to adopt this resolution because it not just the resolution but the follow-up behind it what we do to I guess follow through with the intention of it is going to make a big difference to our our children and future generations Thanks, Laura. Do you have any yeah. any questions? Did I? I was going to say maybe it would be good if Laura, you left your uh, contact information with Judy Kidner, and then if okay. people are wondering how to find you, they can. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think this might be a good opportunity to just let the community know uh, the the policy that uh, Yellow Springs has adopted in terms of renewable energy sources for our electricity. We are. We're going to have a one what, kilo? Megawatt. megawatt solar facility on a uh, village owned property on the glass farm. We have, right now, we're, going to, we're about 90%. Right, 85, we'll, 85 we'll be to 90%. About 90% renewable elect, uh, sources for our electricity. So in, the village government really has been working on this. And we really, anyone who wants to help, you can join the Energy Board, you can join uh, the Environmental Commission or uh, the Yellow Springs Resilience Network. I mean, there's a lot of interest and there's a lot of bodies that need to help with this. So thank you. 
I, I think part of what the, uh, what the group working on the Climate Action Plan found out is that a lot of these things are things that we can't necessarily influence. A lot of it is transportation related, which we don't necessarily have influence on except for our own fleet. I mean, we do have a fleet of trucks and automobiles that, um, you know, we could potentially set policy for as to what kind of fuel vehicles we will be looking at in the future. But, you know, there are a lot of initiatives that we don't have direct hand in but I think support and, and would encourage the community to, to get involved um, in, in any way they can. And as Judith said, and actually there's going to be something that comes up in Patty's uh, manager's report that's going to, to be an unfortunate situation for this in that um, something the Energy Board was working on is, is, is going to be put on hold. So I'll, I'll just leave that to Patty to explain. Um, did anyone else want to speak? Karen, I, I, Karen, I do, sorry. Okay. I do want to note that we actually, I have set a policy as we replace vehicles that we should try to go to hybrids or electric vehicles. And so I think you're going to see two perhaps in the capital budget, both of, one of which is a hybrid and the other which is electric. I, I know that folks aren't, really, aren't necessarily happy with the idea of natural gas, but it still seems a little bit better than, than gasoline. It, or diesel is, um, and I believe that there is a natural gas fueling station about five miles away. Is that something that's being considered? It, there was, a, there's actually a, a magazine called Fleet Management, um, and they had a big story on that not long ago. And um, Johnny and Jason have both started looking into that, okay. as well as the electric and the hybrids. And, and since we talked about the solar array, um, Patty, is there also an opportunity for um, village residents to improve their own use of... <laughs> wow. All right. Um. <laughs> uh, yes, there, terms, there, yeah. there will be a, what we're waiting for is Melissa um, is going through some software updates right now as we speak and I believe you're going to training next month on the new accounting system and we're trying to find out how that we can do green accounts within that system um, so that once the solar array goes online we can make green accounts for the residents who are so inclined. Okay, so then we'll, we'll have an update about that one once Yes. It's, okay, yes. great. So anyone else from um, Mothers Out Loud or um, any... Mothers out front, not out loud. <laughs> Excuse me, out loud. We, we can be loud. Right? Yeah, loud. please be loud. <laughs> All right, my name is Christine Reedy. I'm a resident here in the village, and I want to thank you guys for taking up this resolution. Um, it's a really important thing. Um, climate change as a whole, uh, thinking about it, is um, a huge problem that uh, makes all of us feel very small and powerless. But um, what I've found, especially with working with Mothers Out Front, is the idea of local action and working together can help us tackle this giant problem. So um, all of us across the United States who um, care about the environment have um, started to take action by adopting the Paris Climate Agreement, you know, whether or not our um, federal government decides to um, follow these, uh, follow this agreement. So I just want to thank you that um, we'll work together with you through incremental change to create a bigger solution to this very large problem. Thank, thank you. you. And I do think we've kind of made it a practice now that when we have the opportunity to make a statement um, against what we see happening nationally and in other arenas that we aren't happy with that we will um, we will do these sorts of things to make our, our statement about what the, this community values. Anyone else? Steve? Village Council members. State your name, please. My name is Steve Hetzler. <clears throat> I live at the corner of President and Corey Streets here in town. There are too many dogs in this town. There are too many We're, cats. Are, well, is this about the climate? Is this about what they're talking about in the legislation? No, I thought okay, there was a chance no. for anybody to speak. No, no, no. This isn't, it's not citizens' concerns time yet. But citizens' I'll, concerns will come up later. It'll come up okay. a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to talk about this. No, but I'm in favor of climate. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, Lauren? 
So my name is Lauren Mikesell, also with Mothers Out Front, and I'm here on behalf of my four and seven year old. Uh, we also live in Yellow Springs, and I want to thank you all for taking on, um, putting this onto the agenda, voting on it, and standing behind the Paris Climate Agreement. It means a lot to us all. Um, I think that I can speak for many of us when we say that we aren't just here, uh, another person coming into this room asking you to do something and then going to walk right out like, okay, they did that. We are here and we do want to be involved. We want to help. We want to get our hands dirty. We want to know what's going on and we want to know how we can help and how we can um, help get the word out to the community. When the solar field starts, you know, how can we help change um, perceptions of things or do things to help community awareness or help you overcome the barriers that you have in this community to make sure that we're doing what's best for our children. Great. Thanks, Lauren. I'll Thank make you. sure to get all of your contact information. <laughs> So, are we ready to vote, Council? Yeah. All those in favor, <clears throat> excuse me, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, great. Uh, next is an ordinance. Um, well, we can just read this in by title only and then we'll have Melissa. Oh. Um, do you want to read it in by title only? I can only read it in, in by title, title only. Adjusting summer sewer rates, amending section 1048.05 service charges of chapter 1048 sewers and sewerage sewers and sewage of section 10 streets utilities and public services of the codified ordinances of the village of yellow springs can i get a motion please no no second okay um this is a first reading we discussed it briefly at the last meeting um melissa this is your topic to address yes there is a um there is a brief correction um, that actually Brian had noted um, in this ordinance. Um, I'm trying to pull up the right thing here. Um, basically, I'll, while this is pulling up, um, what what I brought to council two meetings ago was um, some some proposed changes with um, the summer sewer ordinance that we have. Um, there were a few things that I wanted to um, try to um, address, which was apartment complexes, um, as well as um, adding in a um, cap to the uh, amount of an adjustment that could be given um, to any, any customer that signed up. Um, and then at the last meeting, council was in favor of making the, the proposed changes. And then at the last meeting, um, when I had intended to bring legislation, we had uh, found that there were actually two ordinances um, that were both addressing in very different ways the exact same um, notion of dealing with water that does not go down the sewer and is used for watering in the summer months. Um, so there was an ordinance back in 2011 which basically mandated that all um, all customers that were asking for an adjustment actually supply their own meter and pay for those um, charges for installing the meter. And, um, and then in 2014, there was another ordinance that was enacted with our current practice, which is um, to look at the summer month or the winter months and then compare that usage to the summer months and then any difference would be credited on a customer's um, bill that they receive in October. So council had, um, had asked that we just go ahead and continue to modify as planned um, in the ordinance that was brought in 2014 and then to repeal the one in 2011 and clean that up. So um, in front of you um, would be the revised ordinance from 2014 which was codified and um, let's see it's 2017-12 would be the new one and in exhibit a we have um, 1048.05 service charges and that whole section is being replaced but the only real notable changes are in section g um, this is addressing the the summer sewer adjustments in the way that we had been handling them um, the the biggest reason for bringing it before council was because the language was based off of the quarterly billing system and um, now that we're on the monthly billing system, it does change how we do things. So um, in this ordinance, we are still going to look at December, January, and February. And then what we'll do is we will compare that um, to usage in the summer months, which, is, which are June, July, and August. And there is a correction, one, two, three, four, the fifth line down. Instead of January, February, March, it should continue to read December, January, February. So it's those three, or those three winter months. And um, we are going to cap a maximum adjustment at 6,000 gallons, which would be 2,000 gallons of water per month. 
and um, and then it also addresses the notion of apartments and other multi-unit housing situations if they if they have an outdoor area um, the landlord will be able to designate which account the adjustment would be made to so if there is um, a tenant or um, a, a spigot that um, is tied to one of the accounts, the landlord can designate um, which, which tenant um, would be responsible for taking care of those um, watering duties of any gardens or anything that are on the property. And then um, Section H um, had to do with the metering that we discovered back from 2011 so that all of that is struck through. So that was a lot. So. I wanted to ask about Section H. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it says that it's permitted that you could, you know, have this sewer adjustment meter. I mean, uh, and I just wanted to understand the logic of why we're not allowing that option. I mean, if somebody wanted to go to the expense and... If, if somebody wanted to go, and I know that we have some of the larger customers that have irrigation systems, they do have that metered separately because it is a lot of water. So mm -hmm. we, we have permitted it even though it wasn't codified. Okay. So from, from what I had read and looking at the minutes from the old meeting, that was the way of dealing with any credit that was going to be given for sewer um, based off of the water being used for the summer, <coughs> summer uses. So that was the solution which is you know the same the same situation that the um, summer sewer adjustment is um, addressing as well so it was very confusing because we were saying it needed to be metered and that was where section H came from and then we were saying well we were going to do this estimated adjustment so there are it's not that we do not permit meters because we do have a few customers that have large irrigation systems Okay. And will that continue? I mean, if, if mm -hmm. somebody, so that yes. could continue. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody had over, um, you know, they were using over 6,000 gallons, which is a lot of water. If they were using over 6,000 gallons, then there would be nothing to stop them from allowing their own meter to be put in. Okay. Right. So should we keep H in? Um, if, it's, if it's just saying are permitted rather than required? I don't, I mean, I don't think that it could hurt. I just know that the, when I was reading back through the minutes, the intention was that it was, it was solving the summer issue. So we, we could keep H. Why don't we think about that? I mean, this is the first reading. Mm -hmm. So why don't you look at that, have, have um, legal counsel look at it, make sure there isn't something in there that unintended, that might be an unintended consequence. So okay. let's look at that for the next reading. Okay, yep, we can do that. The other thing that I would like to ask about is is um, the, the permitted or approved purposes. It says yard and garden watering. Uh, I personally would prefer that being limited to establishing a new lawn and not not constant watering of a of grass. I don't know if there's any way to differentiate that, um, but. It's, I just don't like to see a lot of water just used on grass to mm -hmm. keep grass green. Um, Karen, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think that that might involve quite a bit of staff time to actually okay. determine whether somebody has like overseeded their lawn and they're trying to True. get the new seed going or whether it's just to keep the grass green. So okay. that would be my only concern there. Okay. I, I had a question about the multifamily section. Um, if there's an exterior uh, spigot, wouldn't that be the landlord's responsibility if it's a multifamily? It, it just depends on what account that would be tied to because I, I don't think that in most cases they're on a separate account. There may be some units which are on a separate account, um, but I think that this, I was trying to cover all of our bases by saying that the landlord could either design, to, could designate which account it was, if there was somebody that was taking care of it, or if if it was their own account. Um, because what we've seen is we've had we've had um, several people in in the same unit apply for the summer garden and uh, yard watering, and there wasn't a yard or a garden that we were aware of. So if if there is one, then the landlord could say yes. You know, unit C is the one that takes care of that. So if they could be eligible for that adjustment because they I use see. their water to do that, or the spigot is tied to their their account. There seem to be some complexes where 
what you would consider to be um, complex utilities, utilities that serve the entire complex are actually yeah. tied into a single unit, mm -hmm. and which is very odd. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that she's trying to cover her bases on that to make sure that if there is an individual tenant somehow paying for what, in my mind, would be for the complex or for the entire um, development that they could get the credit. I see. Any other questions or comments from council? Questions or comments from citizens? Dorothy? State your name, please. Hi, my name is Dorothy Bouquet. I am just a bit confused about how you assess who uses water. So is it just by comparing to their consumption in December, January, February, mm -hmm. or do you like go from property to property and check out if people are using their water. <laughs> no, the way that the program works is you have to actually sign up and we have a form that's online and we also have a form that you can pick up in the utility office. So you can say that you are interested in receiving that credit and you can sign up. And what we do is we keep all of those forms and then what we do is in September, when the September billing is being done at the end of the month to be sent out at the 1st of October, then um, those customers that had signed up, we look at their summer usage and compare it to their winter usage with the assumption that that additional usage in water is being attributed to the watering. Got it. And so um, we would look at that and any difference that there is up to 6,000 gallons is, is the new change. Anything up to 6,000 gallons would be, the sewer portion would be adjusted off of the customer's bill. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. And they have to sign up every year too. Okay. Any other questions or comments? What's the program called? The list is being signed? What, is there a certain is, name for it? Or? It's just called the Summer Yard and Garden Watering Program. And where would you find an application for this? Online or in the utility office. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, Council, are we ready to vote? Judy, would you please call the roll? <coughs> yes, House. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I, I'm going to abstain right now because I think H has to stay in. So. Well, why don't you make a motion? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I'd like to make a motion that we amend to keep Section H uh, in this statute. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I, but I still want it to be checked. I want some, I, you know, I'm not saying that you didn't read it in full sure. and you don't totally understand, but I want to make sure that there isn't some unintended consequence. Um, so we'll have that in the next or modified in mm -hmm. some, in the next reading. Okay. Okay, so I'm roll calling on the amendment. Oh, Lord in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> So we're roll calling on the amended ordinance. Yes. Correct? Okay. Housh? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Winter? Yes. Okay. I can just try to really quick read in that ordinance 2713 if you'd like. Yeah, and then we'll, I mean, I don't know how long it is, but then we'll just have most, oh, it's a very long one, so Patty or, or Chris will explain this. Okay. Do you want title only or do you want Just the, go ahead and do title only. Shebang. All right, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into an option agreement for the sale of eight acres of real estate and declaring an emergency. Can I get a motion, please? So, second. Okay. So, um, this is a little bit of a follow on to a resolution that um, we passed at the previous meeting related to the sale of um, eight acres at the CBE to the folks from Cresco. Um, there was a little bit after the uh, attorneys got together, they decided to do it a little differently. So that's what this is about. And um, it, just to repeat myself as we've repeated ourselves um, throughout this discussion, all of these things are emergencies. This is an emergency um, because of the fact that their application has to be into the state by June 30th and there will not be another council meeting uh, before that time. And they do have to have confirmation that council will sell this real estate to them. So that's why we're doing it as an emergency, which means tonight will be the only reading. So Chris, would you explain the uh, situation to us? Sure, I, I think you did a great job of summing it up. Um, when this process started, uh, the uh, any prospective uh, company that wants to uh, cultivate marijuana under the Ohio law 
has to demonstrate that they have what's what you would call site control. Do they have the ability to, to have land that's available that is zoned for the use in, that's intended? They have to demonstrate that by documentation uh, that is uh, our specific forms that the state has created. Because the sale of real estate uh, by a municipality requires an act by ordinance, not resolution, at the last meeting, I indicated that we, while we had approved a resolution to enter into the option agreement, it was possible that uh, uh, Cresco would come back and ask that we do something by ordinance because it has uh, a power of law at that point to enforce. And so uh, that, in fact, is what happened from our discussions as we were negotiating the terms and conditions of the option agreement. And you can tell that it's a fairly lengthy document and there were extensive revisions that we had on both sides. Um, the uh, Cresco has uh, agreed to put up a $20,000 non-refundable uh, deposit that will be held in escrow should they not exercise the option, which essentially means that because the village is taking that property off the market uh, during this period of time, uh, that there's an economic cost to that. So that's the reason why that uh, amount would be uh, returned to the village couple exceptions here or there, uh, but fundamentally, uh, when you think about this transaction is, if Cresco is given a license by the state, they will exercise the option and uh, uh, move forward. That $20,000 is deducted from the actual uh, total purchase price, uh, and I think that council has articulated uh, the, the reasons and why uh, it's good for uh, the village to go forward in this transaction in terms of economic development, um, and this is that step in moving forward to um, enable this process to occur. Comments, questions for Chris Council? Mm -mm. <coughs> Comments, questions from citizens? I just have a question. Sure, can, can you come up, ma'am? Sorry. My name is Florence Randolph, and I just have a question about the $20,000 that are put. I see in here that it's $20,000 per acre um, that we're selling it at, and you said they're just putting up $20,000 to hold. What's the $20,000 for? Just to be an escrow in case they don't yeah. get approval? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the reason being is that because that portion of the real estate is being taken off the market, there there's a value to that. And so the $20,000 would, would stay with the village. So the value is $20,000 and eight acres is 20, it's eight times 20,000 is my the, math. The, is that's correct. different. The purchase price for the property is eight acres times $20,000 for a total of $160,000. But the escrow just to hold the property in in lieu of of them. The de if the deal falls through, then we would be able to keep that twenty thousand. Okay, thanks. Right, thank you. Um, if they don't get their license, what, what we're not going to be thinking that way. Um, any Oops. comments? Uh, or, uh, oh, wait, I do oh, have a question oh, sure. on that. Sorry, Jerry. Oh, do, uh, do we know what the time frame is for the licensing? September, September or um, October. Okay. Yeah, it's supposed to be 90 days. Okay. Jerry, did you want to make any additional no, comments no, about well, your visit? No, my, my question, because I thought what I understood was if they were awarded the license and didn't go through, we got to keep the 20000 Or did I hear? The 20, yeah, regardless. They don't okay, the okay. Because, again, there's an economic okay. cost. No, I'm, just, I, I, I'm taking the property. Okay. Home. We're losing the opportunity to continue to market. Okay, I just wanted to, I thought I heard something different. Any other comments or questions from citizens? Steve? No, this issue. We're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> we don't make it easy. Um, okay, um, Judy. <laughs> Okay, Melissa, would you like to call the roll, please? <laughs> sure, I can call the roll. <laughs> you could be out with Mallory instead. Memfling? <laughs> yes. McQueen? Yes. Sims? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. You did that Thank very you. well. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so now we're on to staff reports. Patty, would, we'll start with you. Um, okay, again, the Gaunt Park pool is open. Pool passes are available at the pool uh, between 1 and p.m. and 7 p.m. daily. Swimming for all passes must still be obtained from Ruth Ann Lilly through my office during normal business hours. Um, as Karen noted earlier, the Energy Board had previously recommended that um, we contract with Empower Energy to uh, provide certain services uh, to the village residents to help reduce their energy consumption. Uh, unfortunately, Empower is going through a restructuring now and um, they wanted to hold off on implementing that program until sometime in the fall. So they are going to get back in touch with the Energy Board once they complete their restructuring and we will then look at that program again. Um, Can I make a suggestion yes. that <coughs> perhaps the Energy Board can consider other companies yeah. um, since it sounds like things may not be we actually totally also talked to there. yeah we actually also talked to a company called go sustainable which ironically works with empower on a lot of projects so there are other options that we did look at and probably could revisit if empower is not in fact the way we want to go um, our current contract with Rumpke expires in mid-August, um, but there is a stipulation for us to um, add three additional one-year periods to our contract. I did check with all of the staff uh, to see if we had had any issues with Rumpke, and we have not. So unless council uh, voices some objection, I will contact Rumpke about extending the contract for a year. Um, well, I'd like to speak to the recycling issue. Okay. Uh, I think it's been very confusing for me. I think everyone, uh, you know, I used to put yogurt containers and things like that in and then found out what last year or something that they're not accepted. And um, it really means that we probably most of us, unless you somehow avoid using plastic containers, are throwing away a lot of plastic. So I'd really like to see a much stronger recycling program. And that is actually something that the Environmental Commission is, is working on and I will talk to Rumpke about it. They do have the state-of-the-art facility down in Cincinnati um, where most of the recycling goes except for the glass. And we are planning on visiting that. The um, Green County Solid Waste is planning on visiting that facility sometime this fall. Um, unfortunately, what you can recycle changes relatively frequently. And you know you can't do the yogurt containers right now, but you could possibly do them again in the future. Um, so uh, we will try to keep ahead of it and ask Rumpke, Rumpke to give us some more updates on a more regular basis. Now, I don't know whether an educational program is included in the contract that the mm -hmm. uh, Environmental Commission was mm -hmm. discussing this, but at least it would be really nice if people understood what is recyclable. On a, you know, if the village, maybe the village could put something in the uh, utility bills uh, quarterly mm -hmm. saying this is, this isn't recyclable? Actually, um, Bettina is working on that. Yes, I, Bettina I know. Bettina Stolzenberg is working on that part. And Susan is also, um, she is actually filming some uh, spots with Dana Stortz um, for Channel 5 that we've been asked to share with many of the other municipalities uh, in the area. Um, Dana has a, uh, a quarterly recycling update program going where she gives different uh, tips and hints and I know that Susan and Dana are in contact uh, about those information announcements. Can, can we do stickers that go on top of the containers? We asked them for updated stickers the last time and what they gave us instead was a flyer so but we can ask Let's again. Let's talk about stickers. I like the idea of having it right on top of the trash can or the recycle mm -hmm. container. And I guess while we're following up on it I also remember Tom talking about that um, some things like styrofoam, for example, they don't always recycle it, but if there is a demand for it, then they will grab it. So that'd be a good piece of the information. Right. That it changes constantly what, what they will take out of the stream and what they'll leave into the stream. And, and uh, so it's, that's why it's difficult to get the updated materials from Rumpke is because it changes so frequently. So if they do a sticker today, four months from now, it may not be 
a correct sticker and somebody's not recycling something they could recycle. So and, and, everything in. and specifically cardboard, I have a real lack of understanding of how cardboard, I see a lot of cardboard being out on the street that is clearly <coughs> going to be picked up by trash. Is Do they pick it up and recycle it or um, I drive about once a week over to Green County, over to Xenia to take it to <coughs> Green County, take cardboard to Green County and I would love to not have to do that. I put my cardboard in my recycle container and when Rumpke picks it up, what happens is it gets sorted out at the Monument Avenue okay. plant and then it takes they take it down to Cincinnati. So okay. But it is whoever grabs it first. But, but is it, I mean, isn't there a risk of it being contaminated by other, and, and I, my understanding is that cardboard, if it gets contaminated, it can be a problem. Right, that's why you can't put a, throw pizza a, box, a pizza yeah. box in your recycling, yeah. So. So I mean, obviously, recycling is a huge, mm -hmm. is a huge of huge interest to this community. Yeah, and, and Yellow Springs actually has the highest recycling percentage of any community that in this region because we get the monthly stats and it's kind of a little competition we have going at the Green County Solid Waste, but nobody's caught us yet. So, <laughs> um, I was confused. Did we have spring cleanup this spring? Mm -hmm. We did. Okay, I somehow missed that. Um, the uh, ICLE, if council remembers, um, about a year ago, the Environmental Commission came and asked council to uh, join ICLE, uh, take a membership in ICLE to help with the Climate Action Plan. Since that time, we've discovered that the ICLE plan is mostly for larger communities uh, and doesn't really suit Yellow Springs, which is why we've begun work on our own Climate Action Plan. <coughs> Our membership is due, and I believe, uh, Marianne, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Environmental Commission in, in the we, we, we voted is. to uh, not renew it because right. recommending uh, to not renew it's it. not really useful for us. So um, just as an informational thing for council, uh, we will not be renewing the ICLE membership. Okay. Um, Let's see, I have been appointed to the Ohio, the Green County, Ohio Public Works Commission committee uh, to represent all of the villages in uh, the district um, green, in Green County um, during the grant process, just so council's aware of that. We have had a horrible time trying to find uh, seasonal workers for the public works crew and so we have uh, finally gone to a temp agency um, we advertised it three times and uh, did not get any, uh, well, I think we got two applications total all three times. Um, and neither candidate met the qualifications. And so we have signed with the temp agency for the rest of the year and hopefully we can start again next year new and get some more applications. I lifted the stop work order for majors in, um, Majors Enterprises, which is the company that's doing the work out on Dayton Yellow Springs Road at East Enon. Uh, they hopefully will start work next Monday um, back and get that project finished up. And finally, I will be on vacation the week of July 3rd. Melissa will be here and will be handling anything uh, that has to do with my office. Great. Patty, when's the uh, bike corral going back in? Uh, the bike corral will hopefully go back this week. Jason hoped to do it last week, but then they had to put some more anchors in the ground um, from where the holes were expanded when somebody hit it. So um, hopefully, and Jason was not here today. Um, okay. So hopefully it will go back in this week. So Melissa, I think there will be fireworks while you're... Yeah, I'll be watching manager. those from my house. <laughs> um, your report? Um, really, the, la the only notable item that I have, because everything else is going to be discussed, um, is just the tax budget. It was supposed to be ready for presentation um, tonight, but we have to notice it in the paper for 10 days, so um, we will be doing that at the next meeting. So that's it for me. Um, and th actually, we did have a nice report from Denise Swinger from Planning, Zoning, and Economic Sustainability. Perhaps that, Jerry, you could review that during the right. commission reports yep. um, chief real chief <laughs> permanent chief <laughs> Brian Carlson 
<laughs> On June 10th, Street Fair Day, the department, we set up a booth and gave away over 2,000 copsicles. <laughs> were they blue? The day. Were they blue? Uh, they were green, blue, red, green, and pink. And people were ordering them by flavor, and we didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, uh, Josh came up with the name Copsicles about four hours into it. It was magic. It was magic. And thank you, Tom, for letting us store those in your meat locker, as well as apparently that's where officers were disappearing to. <laughs> um, the department was included in the, in the trip to uh, Illinois. I traveled with Johnny Burns and uh, um, Councilman Sims, and we, we had a blast. It was a fun drive there fascinating tour of two remarkable facilities I have to say um, if anyone has any questions from you know my vantage point they're more than happy to talk to me anytime about it I have nothing but uh, praise for the work that these guys are doing they're on the cutting edge of uh, the future um, the department is going to begin our walks with an officer first week of August we're still looking for volunteers anyone interested please contact me um, we'll have a preliminary meeting in mid-July to discuss our plan of action for the walks with an officer. We're also pleased to announce that our newest officer, Mariah England, has almost completed her FTO field training and will be cut loose on her own soon. I still have to get with uh, village manager Patty Bates and talk about um, the date, but we're going to be looking at our third sergeant spot here shortly. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, I do have one. Um, are the uh, officers consistently keeping the bike lights in the cruisers? Yes. Okay. We've so. been going through them. I've been. What I did was instead of put boxes out like we did the first time, and everybody just takes, we've been putting in five of each in each mailbox for each officer, and okay. that's a better way for them to maintain them. Good. Great. And, Great. And yeah, there was a suggestion that maybe July 4th fireworks would be a good opportunity to have a bunch of those on hand. Absolutely. Since a lot of people will probably be riding bikes. Okay. Thanks. And it will be quite dark when they're riding home. Yes. Anyone else? Questions for Chief? Thank you. Judy, Thanks. did you have anything? Oh, just thank you for your patience. That was an unexpected series of visits. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Judy, actually, I have one thing for you. Uh, complete streets workshop, and and just to clarify, I probably should have mentioned that in the minutes. Um, the first one is council staff and um, the active transportation committee. Um, so, if you wouldn't mind coordinating with Patty to figure out a date, that would be great. Um, NVRPC's kind of followed up with me about that okay. recently. Okay. Okay. Now is the time in the agenda for items that are not on the agenda. And um, we ask that you come to the podium. We ask that you give your name and keep the remarks to three minutes. Judy will be keeping time. Steve, please come forward. Thank you. My name is Steve Hessler. And like I said before, I live in the corner of Cory and President Streets in Yellow Springs. And resuming my diatribe, there are too many dogs in this town, there are too many cats, there are too many ill-bred dog and cat owners. I have seen owners of dogs allow their animals to excrete on Mills Lawn property, on Methodist Church property. It's a nuisance. I think that dogs should be better controlled in this town. I think dogs should be barred from being in the commercial area downtown. I've sometimes seen dogs start to snarl and fight with each other. I think we all have to be mindful that there are millions of dog bites reported every year in this country. Millions, and there are millions more that go unreported. And the people that suffer most, apparently, are senior citizens and the young. They're the ones most likely to be bitten. I would also ask that, that people who walk their dogs around be more attentive to picking up waste and keeping their animals from excreting other people's property. I've gone ballistic a couple of times watching people just callously let their dogs excrete on my property. I think that all people that walk dogs should have to have a little pail with them. They should have gloves to clean up any residue. They should force their dogs to, to urinate if they have to on curbs or the side of the road and not on people's property and bushes and the like. I would also like to see a situation in which cats have to be licensed and collared. 
I have, I spend a lot of money feeding birds. Birds are an important part of the environment. Nobody should have to be told that. They kill a lot of insects, and birds are an endangered lot in this country. I see cats roaming my property. I've seen some of them try to catch birds. I've suffered the loss of beautiful little wrens, cardinals, jaybirds, to marauding cats. I mean, cats should be collared. They should have to have identifying tags on them and I should be able to catch them and the people who are in charge of animal control should be allowed to round them up if they're uncollared. And if they are collared and they're on other people's property, they should be taken into Xenia to animal control. And anybody who has a cat in animal control and wants to get it out of jail should have to pay a $50 fine to get the cat. And the second time the cat is found trying to commit predations on private property, the cat should be exterminated. I'm really heated about this. I spent a lot of money on, on feeding birds and squirrels and deer in my yard. And I like to see the, these animals preserved. And I think too many people feel that, that having an animal is their prerogative to let the animal excrete on somebody else's property. And as we all know, dogs are very sensitive to that sort of thing, and they're always trying to mark each other's, overmark each other's territory and announce their own presence. Thank you for consideration. Thank, thanks, Steve. Um, and a lot of good reminders to folks. I know I, I see a lot of comments on uh, social media about uh, problems at Mills Lawn and of all places. Um, not that it's acceptable anywhere, but, but certainly um, that's some place. And I do believe there may be some, some units, that some, some waste units, waste bag units that have been installed there. So something to be really mindful of, folks. Um, anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address an issue. My name is Tony Salmons, and I just purchased 401 fair for a pike. Uh, it was uh, under uh, the bank owned it. I'm in the process of fixing it up, making improvements. And uh, when I got there, the basement was full of water because there's no electricity, and obviously the sump pump filled up. I did the work at the, the basement dry and decided to hook up the water. Um, talked to Mr. Burns, uh, he gave me uh, the regulation, or I'm sorry, the, the policy 1046.01. I disagreed with his interpretation. Ms. Burns was uh, nice to uh, talk to me. I still don't agree with her interpretation, but I plan to abide, abide by the tune of $2,700. This, this regulation, oh, I'm sorry, this policy or ordinance has been enforced three times in three years. Uh, I request the council take a look at it. The, the universal talks about rehooking up water. Um, I think it needs to be looked at. If it's a policy, three times in three years is not much. Uh, is it worth it? Uh, to me, $2,700. Uh, the second point I'd like to bring up, and I appreciate Patty taking the time and talking to me spur of the moment. Uh, understood the regular uh, the policy very well gave her interpretation of the policy of course mine's different probably needs to be looked at to make it more clear um, I, I'm abiding by it the second issue is related to that but it disturbs me um, when I went back to the house which is locked and I have purchased it and it's paid for it, boom uh, the water meter was gone there were, and I was presented pictures of the water meter on what was done. Uh, that's good because I lived there, or when I lived there, I knew what was done. I mean, I knew it was, uh, the plumber had taken out pipes and was going to reconnect it because after being in the uh, water for 15 months, uh, I, we didn't deem it was safe. Um, it, what troubles me is the whoever did this from the city entered my house without my permission and took pictures. Um, this is troubling. I, I like to. I just found that out. I'd like to look into that. But main thing, I'd like to have the uh, policy we looked at uh, one made clear. It's uh, 1046.01 through 03 or 0.99. Um, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Patty. I guess council would ask you to. If you I, I had not heard prior to this that anybody entered his... No, I didn't take that because I didn't take the pictures and they were presented to me, ma'am. And I hadn't given anybody from the city permission to get in the house. 
you were there when Brian of Church came, correct? The first time he said was he, he, uh, the water is so deep. He asked me if, if I minded right. him taking off his pants right. because it was above his boots. Okay, and and you were there when Johnny Burns came, correct? Brian's ball. Well, let's, can, yeah, can I let's, see? Let's talk about this. Yeah, I, yeah. I can't confirm that, but I, okay. I have to confirm my All right. I'll, yeah, I'll look into it. Right. Well, we'll, we'll look into it. And what council is asking Patty to look in, into this, um, the, the are, concern. Um, Thank you. I was going to say, I mean, I would like to understand the, I, I guess I'd like to report back to council just to understand what happened, if just, possible. And, 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 just, mm -hmm. just because of the, is it $2,700 to rehook up? It, it has to do with if you, or if your meter has been disconnected because you're doing a major renovation, it has to do with moving your meter outside from inside the house to outside the house um, as part of a, a, a okay. an ongoing I guess I would like to understand it some, to somehow. To things mm -hmm. outside. Yeah. So. so maybe an upcoming you. report you can address it. Yeah. Any other citizens' concerns? Okay. Uh, could, could I, I do have one thing that I came across while I was going through my folder that I meant to announce during okay. my, uh, my report. Um, if council remembers some time back, we did uh, agree to allow the fire department to burn down the Sutton farmhouse mm -hmm. as a training exercise. Um, they're hoping to do that either the 1st or the 8th of July. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I'll to talk to them about that. Um, so next item on the agenda is a presentation from Emily Seibel with Home Inc. about a new project that they're working on. Um, actually, I, if it's possible to still present about Cemetery Street. I'm very confused. Okay, go Please. ahead. Uh, well, I think I'm confused too. Cause <laughs> but um, we had prepared a presentation on the Cemetery Street project wrap up. Okay. Um, we I did also, in addition to that, submit a letter for a tap fee um, waiver. And so I don't know if we're discussing that th this week or next week. Well, I wanted you to dis to present that tonight so that we could be prepared for the resolution next week. Okay, I'm I'm happy to do that. Would you like me to do that under new business or? Um, or? It's, it's listed, right? Oh no, it isn't listed. I know. I, I don't think it's on the agenda. Okay, right. I thought you had said that you didn't want to present on the Cemetery Street project tonight. Oh no, I absolutely do. We have a an incredible presentation prepared by Ellie Brooker Miller Fellow um, from Antioch, and it's her last week at school, so I know she's eager to present. Okay, then that's what we'll do. Is go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. I mean, that's okay. what's on the agenda. It's okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Ellie is getting us all set up now. She's a Miller Fellow <laughs> with Yellow Springs Homemake. So while she's getting it set up, I'll just say um, I'm Emily Seibel, Executive Director of Yellow Springs Homemake. And our mission is to strengthen community and diversity in Yellow Springs and Miami Township by providing permanently affordable and sustainable housing through our community land trust. And I deeply appreciate the opportunity um, to provide a final report on the Cemetery Street Project, which was our first partnership with the Village of Yellow Springs to build affordable housing on public land. Yay. <laughs> so the project started when council members Lori Askland and Judith Hempfling proposed using the vacant lot on Cemetery Street for affordable family housing. After a public process, Yellow Springs Home Inc. was selected as the development partner. The village agreed to waive fees and sell the lots at half cost, which were competitive scoring criteria for some of the grant funds that were used to build the homes. It also enabled us to have site control for a sufficient period of time to fundraise and complete pre-development, 
which can be a really lengthy process. And um, I believe site control was was part of uh, the agenda earlier too, but it's a really big consideration in affordable housing development. You have to be able to show potential investors in the project and funders that you have control over the land and that you'll be able to follow through with your promises. So that was a huge benefit um, to working with the village, was making that possible. Um, all four of the homes are energy efficient, under 1,400 square feet. They're two stories, three bedrooms, two baths, and have outside storage. They house 11 children under the age of 18 and eight adults. The families are first-time home buyers of low income. We encountered some challenges as well as some successes along the way. Our top challenge is fundraising. Uh, we originally anticipated that we were going to get funding for this project through the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. However, OFA stopped providing funding for homeownership altogether, which threw a major curveball early on. Uh, but instead of giving up, we decided that we were going to see this through, so we went after a, a number of different funding sources to layer something together that worked. So we ended up funding the project through the Morgan Family Foundation, the Ohio Community Development Finance Fund, the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati, Bike and Build Inc., the Huntington National Bank, Yellow Springs Home Inc. also provided a donation, the Dayton Foundation, and Vectran Foundation. <clears throat> The second challenge is that as time went on while we were doing all of this fundraising, the construction costs went up. Um, so they ended up being more than 25% over our total development cost ceiling dictated by our funders um, <clears throat> and also 25% over budget. So we resolved this issue after the initial shock of getting the bids back. Um, and we're able to lower costs and ultimately make the project work in both of the phases. Um, and how we did that was by way of a great builder who gave us a profit margin discount and completed the work really quickly, um, which lowered our construction interest cost. And we also uh, saved funds creatively because the community stepped up. Um, we had sweat equity, we had volunteer labor, we also did a number of uh, value engineering strategies, and we had a great development team. Uh, I can really honestly say that, that managed this entire project with complete and total integrity, and that included the late John Eastman, who did a lot of pro bono work for us. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about the families in the Cemetery Street neighborhood. The Wyants uh, were the first family, and they purchased the home at 140 Cemetery Street. Little Rudy May, two older brothers, her mother Erica, who works to support adults with disabilities, and her father Caleb, uh, who work at the Little Art Theater, make up that family. They had been renting an apartment with their children in Yellow Springs for several years. And like all of the families that we partner with, the Wyants worked very hard to prepare for home ownership, and they are also very dedicated to both living in and being a part of Yellow Springs. <laughs> Highlights from the project include a landscaping day with Yellow Springs High School seniors who were doing community service, and that was led by Master Gardener Macy Reynolds. Also, the homebuyer family had their first dinner uh, sitting on the concrete foundation of their home during the framing phase um, when we had a volunteer day attended by staff, Antioch students, and others. Together, we, ex we installed extruded polystyrene around the perimeter of the home, you can see it right there, um, for increased energy efficiency and a tight exterior seal to reduce thermal bridging. That's one of the many passive house design features that we were able to include in the project. Um, and the last picture was of the high school students. And here you can see the family at the ribbon cutting ceremony. It was really a lovely project and got the momentum going. 138 Cemetery Street was built for Julie McCowan, David Jan Benning, uh, son Tyrese, and niece Brianna. 
Julie is a true caretaker. She started working at Friends Care Center more than 27 years ago as a nurse's aide, and she also does a lot of home health care providing around town. She has two adult children in addition, um, including Mariah who works at the Yellow Springs Children's Center, and grandchildren who are frequent visitors. She is particularly excited to have a home base. This makes this sound very official. <laughs> she is particularly excited to have a home base that she calls Grandma's Place. Um, and highlights from this project include a really, truly epic volunteer painting day where Antioch College students, nursing home workers, uh, and coworkers, neighbors, family, friends, and staff provided interior priming for the whole entire house in a matter of hours. And particularly touching for me is that each of the homes that were constructed after the first one, the homeowners um, from the previous houses came to volunteer on their future neighbors' houses. So it was really creating a sense of community through the whole project. Um, Huntington volunteers also built an exterior shed for the home on a very cold day, which should, that should be recognized. I think it was snowing. <laughs> Um, and the house went up and very quickly and it was a success. We had a lovely open house that was standing room only um, and that was filled with Julie's friends and family as well as homemade members. And that's Brianna, the niece. Mm -hmm. And the final two homes were built together and sold to families new to town. The Shade family home buyers include Matthew, who is a graphic artist, Elizabeth, a stay-at-home mom, and their four young children aged five and under. Which is a, <laughs> I think they're five, uh, five, three, two, and one. <laughs> they live in Yellow Springs because Yellow Springs has a fantastic school system community groups and organizations, a flourishing arts community and culture. They had a 10-year plan to buy a home and they really wanted to live in Yellow Springs and um, this was the way that it was possible. They say that it's the perfect environment for their family to grow in. The Shades and their friends and family showed up on a Saturday to prime their new home. Father and son painted side by side along with community volunteers and staff. Huntington volunteers, it should be noted on a very cold day, uh, installed a silt fence behind <laughs> both of the homes slated for construction. And it should also be noted that Antioch Miller Fellows with volunteer Richard Zopf um, tested for bedrock depth on a very hot day, um, a project which took several hours. So um, welcome home to the Shade family. There they are at their ribbon cutting <laughs> ceremony, the whole group. And the last home was built for Patrick and Brandy Hange and their two children aged three and under. Patrick is a veteran who works at Costco and Brandy is a stay at home mom. To them, Yellow Springs truly feels like home. They love the community, parks and nature. They specifically said they love the local business climate and they love the presence of sustainability everywhere. A highlight of construction was the interior priming day when the Hanjas brought their three-year-old son Nolan along to help with painting. <laughs> he got to be part of creating his new home, which was really special. Um, and that's the kind of memory that will stay with him, probably in his family for the rest of their lives. So it's really, this is about so much more than just a physical home. It's about a feeling of belonging, creating memories, creating a sense of pride and place, and getting to put down roots in a community. Um, the tree committee also volunteered to plant a native tree for each home, and that was coordinated by the revered institution that is Lloyd Kennedy. So at this point, the neighborhood is now complete. We ended up meeting our project management goals, to stay on time, somewhat miraculously stay on budget, and with high quality construction resulting in a vibrant neighborhood. 
Once fully online, the four homes are projected to generate nearly $14,000 in new annual property tax revenue that supports local services as well as schools. Home energy rating system scores ranged from 55 to 60, which save on average more than 1,200 per home in annual utility costs and use less than half the energy of existing conventional homes of the same size. In the end, we were able to raise more than a quarter of a million dollars in permanent affordability funding to make this project possible, and that money will stay with the homes to make them affordable over generations. The project also provided for more than $750,000 in local economic development, um, and so it was really a, a success. I want to thank you uh, for partnering on behalf of Yellow Springs Home Inc. Uh, to make Yellow Springs a more welcoming community of opportunity for people of diverse incomes. You have shown a commitment to this public goal and we appreciate your action on affordability. We are also honored to be part of this historic project. The whole community is really part of this project. We also recognize that this is just the first step as so many residents face affordability struggles. Today, more than 43% of renters and 28% of homeowners in Yellow Springs are housing cost burdened, meaning they pay more than 30% of income to housing expense. And some pay much more than 30%. In response to this demand, as well as uh, ongoing community feedback, we at Yellow Springs Home Inc. are broadening our focus to include affordable rentals, an expanded area median income reach, attached units, smaller units, and a diverse range of housing types. While we have some projects in the pipeline, uh, such as the letter one described in the letter I submitted today, we recognize that there is a significant need for more affordable housing options. Affordability is an all hands on deck challenge, and it is really, really, and truly important to the future of Yellow Springs. We look forward to the opportunity to partner with the village on future projects to meet this critical public need. And at Yellow Springs Home Inc., our dream is to make the village work for everyone, where we all love where we live, both now and for future generations. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you today. And to wrap things up, we uh, have a gift, which will be presented by Ellie Burke. <laughs> who is our very talented Miller Fellow. She, she created this presentation, which I think it was just so lovely. And she also designed the gift. Um, our gift is a plaque to give to you. And thanks for helping fund this really big project. Um, and it says, in honor and recognition of the Village of Yellow Springs support of affordable housing by way of the Cemetery Street Project in partnership with Yellow Springs Home Inc. 2016. Great. Yay. Thank you. Nice. Right. Set up straight. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Thank you. That's really Thanks. sweet. Thank you. Wow. Everybody else see it. Well, thank you. So, so Emily, were you gonna? Can you take a few minutes so that we're ready for next week? I'd be happy. To Go ahead and do it now. I don't want to revisit it. <laughs> I don't have a, a presentation prepared for this, but I did submit a letter. Um, basically, really early on in every project that we do, we have to come to the village council before we have a site plan, before we've gone through the zoning process, not to get formal approval of the project, but to ask for tap fee waivers and zoning permit fee waivers. And the reason that we do this early on is because it helps us um, get the, the grant funding that we need because it's part of the competitive scoring criteria. So our next project is on a one acre parcel of land in the southern part of the village at 1133 Xenia Avenue. Um, we're actively planning Glen Cottages as a pocket neighborhood. We haven't gotten the funding to do any pre-development work yet other than um, some sort of basic concept planning. So again, this is not um, any sort of uh, final approval. We'll go through the zoning process. Um, but in the first phase of the project, um, and the site is zoned uh, in high density resident C for up to 14 units without any kind of variances. Um, but we anticipate as many as six rentals and two for sale units. Um, and what we'll, we ultimately want to do is create a pocket neighborhood. Um, 
Um, as far as the as the credit that you get um, mm -hmm. from the agency that you're submitting to, is there is, is there a dollar amount um, that they look upon most favorably? Um, I noticed you know your request said all or part. Yeah, um, at minimum it would be five hundred dollars in fee waivers for each application um, to get the the points and we were submitting two applications because we have to submit a different one for rental and home ownership um, in this project phase and then um, but I think the more of a waiver the the bigger the show of commitment for then when we go to the Ohio Housing Finance Agency um, and I do have to say that when um, our Forest Village Homes project was presented um, and just got a five hundred thousand dollar grant from the Ohio Housing Finance Agency, they stated one of three reasons that we got the grant was because of the tremendous show of public support. So it does it does make a difference. And has had had we given waivers on that one? We yes. already given and we gave full waivers on that one? Yes. Okay. So how much is each one? A minimum of five hundred dollars. No, no, but what's the what's the actual amount oh. of the Tap and fees that were seven. Was I don't that's know. something Patty can our, okay. that's right. <laughs> You don't know that. Okay. Our tap fees are three seventy five for water, three seventy five for sewer. So it's a total of seven hundred fifty dollars per unit for the two tap fees. Um, in addition to that, um, I think this would be a PUD. I think is what Denise said. It, well, we're not we're not to that point yet. Okay. We have a, some due diligence to do. So very what, um, if it's a if if it's a PUD, then that's um, two hundred and twenty five dollars uh, for the PUD, uh, and then thirty five dollars per unit for each unit for zoning. So for their to meet their time frame, um, this will need to come as legislation to our July 3rd meeting. What I would I like to ask is for staff to put together a report kind of listing out listing out those numbers. Give us the multiplier of eight units or however it's being done, however it's being requested, mm -hmm. so that we have a report to look at um, to do you, so want it, do you want it with uh, Full and partial fee, wa fee waivers. Just, just uh, tell us what the fee waivers are, what or what the fees are, okay. and then and so you've to already told us that they look for at least five hundred, a minimum of five hundred dollars. Yes. Okay. Wait, is, is, how many how many uh, waivers are we looking for? It, eight units at seven hundred and fifty dollars a unit would be six thousand dollars, and eight units at five hundred dollars a unit would be four thousand dollars. Where would this money come from? Well, it doesn't really come from anything. It's just money that we aren't bringing into our coffers. Well, it's but theoretically, we could. Theoretically, it could come from the general funds to be put into the water fund, correct? Or the utility. It's not funds. coming from anywhere. I understand mm -hmm. that, but I'm. Just would, typically, the reason that municipalities support this beyond the the public good is because it results in infrastructure and property tax revenue. Right. So the, the yeah, I mean, I don't want to be too cautious about this, quite honestly. I, I, um, I uh, feel like um, really it's, it's a small amount of money for a great good. And I would hate to um, minimize what we put in in a way that could actually endanger the ability of Home Inc. to be able to get the, the matching monies. And I don't think you're going to know for right. sure what that, what that uh, like if we did a partial, there's no way you're going to know what, you know, where that cutoff might be, where they felt there was, where in terms of those, it's, a, it's competitive, is it not? Yeah, there, I mean, there, so the initial request is for the Federal Home and Bank of Cincinnati, and they have a very strict point system. So we will get the, we will get the credit for a $500 fee waiver, but if a full waiver would send a stronger message of the strong you're still competing for the Ohio Housing Finance Agency and other funding that comes. So later. could you possibly also provide something that's a little bit more bullet pointed as opposed to a two page letter? So that kind of delineates your schedule when you're going forward, just, just to give us a little briefer um, look at what your projects and uh, what's involved in your project and how many units and yeah so you're yes. talking you're saying that there's two different loans that you're looking at we, we're or grants <laughs> probably they're going to be looking all over the place yeah there will be more than two but the initial two grants we are applying for this summer 
and um, the, it's two different grants because we're proposing both rental and home ownership as part of the project. And so they're to the same funding source, which is the Federal Home Loan Bank. But yes, I'd be happy to, yeah. to I, prepare something. I, I, this is again something where it, it's something that I've, I've talked to the Economic Sustainability Commission about. It's about having at least some policy language behind incentives. This is essentially an economic development incentive. It would be nice to have policy language around when we give these. And I think I think it's fine. I think we've been doing it. I'm not trying to, to make things difficult for Emily or Home Inc. But um, when we give money to any business, when we extend any kind of, of grant or, or um, fee waiver, it's the same as giving money. And I think it, it's good to explain to the community why we're doing it and to have some sort of policy language in place. We aren't going to have that for the situation, but it just brings to mind that it's something that we need to prioritize getting done. Mm -hmm. um, I'd also like to request, there may be other things that the village government could do besides these fee waivers. I don't know. There, there may yeah, be well, things yeah, are, further on. Sure. So uh, I think it would be helpful for a list of things that the village government could might be able to do to show support. Yes, I'd be happy to. Yeah, the fee waiver is typically considered the the smallest gesture of local public support, even though it's still significant, if that makes sense. Um, but like what, what the village did with Cemetery Street um, was impactful um, in getting additional Right, funding. installing the water line and it, the infrastructure as well right. as the selling the land at half cost. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, just 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 so we have information. Yeah, about I that. can I can translate the letter into if, bullet yeah. points that look more statistical. If Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. I guess you were my question, to read. But my question <laughs> is, what what is the legislation that's coming back? You know, uh, to award the fee waivers whatever the fee waivers may be. Okay, but if, okay, so we're, okay, so that's what we've already decided. So th that was gonna be my <laughs> I was question. Say, Normally be a motion the, the like legislation it. has a specific amount. You want me to leave that part blank? And count could we just, yeah, could we just have like the line and once we decide the percentage? So we could have all the other language? Yes. I mean, I think it's clear that we'll we'll go the 500. I mean, why would we do it if we weren't going to at least give them the, the what's required? And I, I, I don't know that it's going to be any different. I just want to I'm consider sorry. it. Okay. I'm sorry, Judy is trying to tell me something. I'm, uh, That's okay. I'm trying to determine whether it's an ordinance or a resolution, and I can't remember. If it's an ordinance, it's very I easy to just tech, put it on the second one. resolution of the I'm past. Sure it was a resolution when yeah. I looked up today. Okay. So Emily, I just want to say, I, you know, related to why we give incentives, uh, we've always appreciated that you've given us um, information about that economic benefit, uh, you know, the breakdown of property taxes and, and those sorts of things, um, because these are the kinds of investments that municipalities need to make, so. And I, I did put that in the letter, but it's, it's enclosed in text. Yes. <laughs> Very nice text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, just conservatively, we're st it's so preliminary now, but just going with a, a very conservative estimate, it'll provide <coughs> easily more than a million dollars in economic development, and I would say easily upwards of 10000 a year in new property tax revenue mm -hmm. for okay. eight units. Thanks. Awesome. So just so be here next on the third? On the third. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I was going to say I'd like to also thank the work that Homie did on the Cemetery Street project. It's excellent. Great project. It's great. And good work that you did too. Thank you. Too. Very, yeah. yes. Thanks very much. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the lodging tax follow-up, for which I am going to recuse myself and turn the microphone over to Brian Hausch. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a couple things that we are going to do with this discussion. First of all, there were some issues that were left unresolved after our last meeting. Um, so I'm going to have, I think, Chris, if you would like to just begin by giving us kind of the uh, high points on the legal aspects that were in question last time. Well, I'm not sure exactly where we left it off, so I'll start with what I understand. Okay. Where we I'll prompt you if there's anything you Good. forget. That would be helpful. Um, 
So uh, the, the first question is, um, may the village uh, impose an independent 3% tax uh, for lodging? The answer is yes. Um, then the next question would be, would half of that go back to the county? And the answer is no, because the county already has its 3% tax. At least that's our interpretation of the code. Uh, the next question is that uh, in light of, uh, and this was an 01 amendment, I believe, right. that if the, the village wanted to uh, put a 3% uh, tax on, lodging tax, we could uh, create our own ordinance that would say one or more so that we can capture that window of one to four. One or more what? One or more guests. Oh. Because prior to 2001, it was five plus rooms. Um, oh. And they changed that in 2001, so it applies to all uh, establishments. Okay. I think. So that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. I mean, the only other question, which I know we're still investigating, is uh, what the county might owe us um, in lieu of not having a lodging tax for the past year. But I know that's still something we're researching. That's, so. that's a separate discussion that, that we need to talk to the county a little bit more because it, it involves other jurisdictions and, and treatment of tax revenues over the years. Okay. Thanks, Chris. I have some more questions. So. Um, does that mean that uh, any of the short-term stay houses, apartments, or even bedrooms that people rent out in Yellow Springs could be, the tax could be applied to those? If, if you say short-term rental, what's your definition? Short-term rental is uh, an apartment or a house um, where someone can rent it for a day, a week, a month, even a few months. but. It's regularly rented at irregular times, and we have about a half a dozen of those places. I think that that's a definitional question that we would address in how we write the ordinance, because if you think about how what that normally is, it's normally expects a turnover, kind of like a bed and breakfast type of scenario. Yeah, they call them a transient guest. And so that's a fine term. Right. So it would not be short-term rentals. Um, like as in how we defined it traditionally a week or a month. Um, yeah, but we didn't define it. I mean, how it is enacted, how it actually is in fact, is that people will rent out an apartment for a day, a week, a month, three months. And well, then, I mean, or, and, or they rent out a bedroom. Yeah, so well, I think we need to know exactly what this could apply to. I was going to say, and Planning Commission, I thought was going to come back with, because there's the question of, you know, people rent a room in their home. It's not a business. And then there's people who have homes that they rent. I mean, it's their home. It's not, it's not a hotel or something. Uh, there's um, obviously people rent out homes long term, so I assume that's not a part of this. But, um, but then there's people who are renting out whole homes short-term rental, they don't live there. That's a different kind of thing also, which I thought, uh, you know, you and I talked with Matt, and I know Planning Commission was kind of looking at that question in right. terms of, right. in terms of uh, regulation, you know, planning, you know. So it right. seems, like, it seems like it could be, it could be uh, related to where we, what we decide there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree that whether it applies to Airbnb needs to be clarified, but this transient guest distinction, when they, it, the definition does distinguish that from somebody that's, you know, renting a home for a month or a week or something like that. Well, Airbnb is just one mechanism. There are different mechanisms, so I don't think it's relevant to tie it to one particular mechanism. Mm -hmm. But having done this, I mean, I think I, if we're going to do it, I'd like to give it a broad uh, application as possible. And as I said, there are at least a half a dozen what, what we in the, what, I don't do this anymore, but what we called short-term stay places. And they're listed on the Chamber of Commerce website. They're listed in Stay Yellow Springs. Um, and, then, uh, and then there are people that rent out just like a bedroom, which is it's a different thing. Yeah. But I would like 
clarity on what it can be applied to and what it can't be applied to. There would be a definitional section in our ordinances, and there is a definition, which I don't know off the top of my head, for what a transient guest is. Now, I'd like a definition before we make a vote on what on this. What's included and what can't, what can and what can't be included. But this is already regulated, correct? We're not, the lodging tax is already? Uh, not within the village. I know we don't have one, but it's, it's um, defined, isn't it defined already? The county is doing it. Uh, in the and, ORC. In the yes. ORC. So we're not going to change that. We're just deciding whether we're going to apply it in, within the village. No. Correct. Well, I well I, I, this is confusing. Yeah. yeah. What I what I heard, thought you were saying is that we have that the village has the ability to pro, to apply it to a broader seg segment <laughs> of rent. Right. It, so we will. The county has a standard. We're not going to do anything that's going to change that. But we can. I believe that we can independently capture of transient guests that something less than five which is currently not captured, as I understand it, by the county. Okay. And, and, we w and what I'm asking is that we find out exactly what we can do before we write legislation and, and, and apply right. it. And actually, Melissa found, found that definition, I, so we can put it in the packet. So um, I, I, I don't remember uh, it off the top of my head, but it did distinguish, I mean, it's, it's designed to be like someone that stays at a B&B or a hotel. So, but you're right. We should have that clear. So, all right. Okay. Well, I, I have a question for you, Chris. Do, do we have, a, say if we were to implement this tax, do we have an, an option to be able to say when that would go into effect or would it, if we want to broad brush it, does that say it goes in effect immediately on every one as we defined it, or? Well, uh, let me ask a question with a question. Answer a okay. question. question. Um, I would anticipate that we would use an ordinance because we would put that in our codified ordinances. Is there something that you're thinking of that we would do it by emergency legislation? Well, no, let's say, for example, if we're talking about, say, a, a hotel or a residence and a person, and, and, and let's use Mr. Hammond as the example, where uh, last time we spoke at the last, the last meeting, he said, you know, it takes, it may take him five years or whatever. So if we were to enact uh, legislation, or we call it, uh, we could we single out a particular uh, segment or whatever our definition is and say for this particular one it could go in effect years out or if we passed it does it basically say that boom it goes in effect for everybody right now so the the general answer is that if using an ordinance it usually takes effect 30 days after mm -hmm. passage, we could change the effective date to sometime in the future beyond that 30 days. Okay. But on the, the, the crux of your question is, can we treat someone differently than that somebody else? And the answer is, I would caution against okay. that. The tax code says that it has to be uniformly applied. Mm -hmm. and by definition, if you exempt someone who's in a similarly situated, that would be lead to a potential equal protection argument because they're not being uniformly treated. Melissa, you don't remember the transient guest thing? I don't remember. Okay, because it, it was in the OML I'll see if thing. I can look it up while we're I think okay. the legislation was in 2000, though, so it was it was older. Right. What changed that? Okay. When it went to even single rooms, from single rooms. Yes, it was, I think it was 2000 or 2001 is when that changed. Right. Well, oh, okay. Um, I am in favor of at least continuing to investigate doing this tax. Um, I would say I'm in favor of doing the tax um, at a, I, I would say, 1% rate. 
that's what I'm suggesting, just to get it in the door, sort of. But I'd also like to apply it as broadly as we could, and I also, and I understand that doing that will create more uh, difficulties with for staff, I think, because then that really means that we will need to more regulate um, the various types of short-term rentals that we have in the village. And that's going to create more work, more problems, more hassles. So uh, I guess I, I'd really like for staff to be able to, I mean, <laughs> I'd like for staff to be able to think about this and say what are the in bo both what are the exact establishments that we could tax and what are the issues that would happen if we decided to do that. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say you're absolutely right. It will create more of a burden for staff. Um, we'll have to come up with a way for folks to be able to, um, you know, let us know what they're doing some type of permit system. Um, it could be administered, that part could be administered by zoning. Um, the actual collection of the revenues obviously would have to go through Melissa's department and she would, I'm sure, be able to come up with a procedure for that. So, you know, we will, obviously if council chooses to, to pass this in whatever form, we'll find a way to properly implement it. I was going to say, if we're going to consider um, including people who rent one room through, you know, uh, venues like Airbnb, for example, I personally feel that that should we should wait until we hear from the to from the uh, planning commission and make a decision about the kind of regulation we're going to do, because at the moment there's basically no regulation. People are allowed to, I mean, and and I know. Uh, Planning Commission is considering that, and so it seems to me it could be added in if we um, if we decide we're going to be doing more regulation. But you know, I think we have to understand what the impacts are on um, on the staff. You know, if it ends up costing us more to do it, then it's <laughs> then it's going to get us. And I don't think it's you know. So I I think that piece is more complicated, and I don't know that we need to wait on this. Uh, immediate issue until we figure that out. That could be added in later. Whether we add, we can make that decision. Whether we add those kind of places in uh, later. Um, um, you know, I had a really nice conversation uh, with Mr. Hammond and uh, his uh, worker Phil. Uh, I forget his last name. Renfro. Very nice fellow. Um, and I wanted to just say I really appreciated the conversation and um, just um, hearing from Jim, you know, just kind of the passion with which he has, you know, been in a sense a benefactor for the in the region, you know, using his passion for preservation um, of the mill uh, out in you know the Grinnell Mill and then the um, the old uh, covered bridge and this uh, beautiful building in the middle of our town which replicates a historic building. Um, I really appreciated, you know, hearing firsthand, you know, what motivates you in uh, what you've done in this, in this area. Um, so I wanted to say that. Um, it's a beautiful building. I hadn't been in it before, uh, unfortunately, but I was really glad to just see as I walked through. Um, it's, it's a very special experience you have when you go to the Mills Hotel. It is not like other hotels. I mean, uh, it's, an, it's, an, it's beyond just staying overnight somewhere, uh, having a meeting. It's a whole experience. And so I'm feeling like people who would want to come to the Mill Hotel um, are going there with that expectation of really having this uh, beautiful place to stay and this special restaurant, good food. And so it's, it's, a, it's a destination. It's not just staying overnight somewhere. Um, but uh, this lodge tax, um, one thing that you know I mentioned at the last meeting at the discussion, um, I was concerned that um, anybody would think that the village doesn't support uh, the Mills Hotel and its and its success, 
And, um, and so I wanted to just say that I think the village, uh, anything we can do to support any business in the village, and certainly Mills Hotel is one of those, uh, is, you know, we should be doing that. And if there's any confusion about that we, we don't support it, I think uh, we want to be very clear that's not true. Um, the village has a lot of services that you know cost uh, cost money, and the problem for the village is is that we're trying to pay for those things, and so we're looking at the different places. You know, we're we're becoming it's becoming difficult for people to afford to be here, and uh, so I guess you know I don't want it to be seen as anti the Mills Hotel or anti any of the other lodging establishments of the village, but I do feel like. Um, from what I can see, that uh, that that competitive edge of not having a lodging tax, I just I, I just can't quite see because it's such a special place that it's directly competing uh, with other kinds of of hotels. And I wondered if there was a way, though, that we could, since we haven't had a lodging tax, if we could decide, you know, the first year we do one percent. Uh, or maybe the first two years, and then two years, it's two percent, and then two years, three percent. That we kind of ease it in. Um, if people, people who have lodging here in the village, find that you know can show that it's really negatively affecting their business, then I think we can look at that. But I, I just find it. Uh, I, I just feel like it is such a special. I, I know that the particular uh, lodging place that's been concerned is, is the Mills Hotel people. And um, I, I feel like, uh, I mean, I, I do support us moving forward with some kind of a lodging tax. We could implement it over a period of you know, years, but I think we should consider going forward with it. Well, and I think that's a good segue to, uh, uh, Chris, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, just quickly, I, I found the definition of transient guest. It's found in mm -hmm. uh, Ohio Revised Code Section 5, 573901. Uh, and it's a pretty simple definition. Transient guests means persons occupying a room or rooms for sleeping accommodations for less than 30 consecutive days. Pretty simple. Um, Patty, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you brought, uh, uh, provided for the packet? Yeah. I was asked to do uh, to research two items. Um, one was the potential uses of the lodging tax, and the other was the tax abatement that Mills Park Hotel had uh, apparently asked for but not received. Um, so the first question was, what could we potentially use the lodging tax for? Um, and the law stipulates that the revenue goes into the general fund, but you have to understand that the general fund supports a myriad of different uh, potential uses. Um, so uh, the lodging tax could be used to support things that help make Yellow Springs a place that people want to visit, would make it a, a destination town. And some of those items could include support for overtime, staff work to support special events, sidewalk repair, park maintenance, public art such as the art cans and the bronze sculpture trail, uh, maintenance of the Yellow Springs Station, which is the, the center where most of the visitors in town go for uh, information. This is not meant to be an all-inclusive list. It's, uh, it, again, the general fund supports a huge number of different um, services. These are just a few that staff brainstormed about and came up with. So um, do you want me to stop there for discussion, or do you want me to continue with this? I think you could talk about the other piece, too. OK. Um, so one thing that was mentioned um, at the last meeting was that Mr. Hammond had applied for a tax abatement um, for the Mills Park Hotel. And I was not here during that time period, so um, I was asked to research it. Um, and in doing that, I spoke with Eric Henry at the Greene County Department of Development. Um, Mr. Henry advised me that the hospitality business, which Mills Park Hotel is a hospitality business, um, they are not eligible for income tax abatements or for tax abatements except in blighted areas. And so that would not apply to the Mills Park Hotel because Yellow Springs is not considered a blighted area. And this is different from uh, manufacturing abatements such as DMS Inc. Those are 
two entirely different types of tax abatements. Um, so he also advised that as far as he had been able to find, there was no record of Mr. Hammond applying for such an abatement, but that he would continue to look. And, and he admitted that perhaps he just wasn't finding it in the records. Um, so then I thought, well, I would speak to my two immediate predecessors, Laura Curlis and Kent Bristol. Um, Laura told me that, uh, honestly, she didn't think that she had ever met you, um, Jim, um, and uh, that uh, she thought she would have remembered because she was going to ask you about the biplane that you fly. Um, but she was only in uh, tenure uh, I think when you bought the property and while you were demolishing the house that was on the property and then she left, Kent Bristol came in as the uh, interim and um, he, he advised me, Kent advised me that he had talked to you about a potential TIF district which is tax increment financing district um, which is different from a tax abatement because the tax increment financing district uh, some of the tax money comes back to the village to go directly into the infrastructure improvements on the property. Um, but because that was such a small development and it was such a short time frame, um, that um, that was not something that ever came to fruition. Okay. So. Um, and I guess I'll just underscore one thing that uh, Judith referred to is that uh, the village does make investments uh, in infrastructure to support economic development. And um, as Patty discussed the last meeting, there was a substantial investment made that, that benefited, um, I, I would argue, not just Mills Park Hotel, but residences and other businesses in town. And, uh, and I think that was an important investment that was made. Um, Jerry, do you want to say anything before? I know some people want to make a few comments. I uh, know I'm still gathering information. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, what I'd like to do is remind people of two things. One is that we do have a three-minute time limit. Uh, Judy will make sure that, that I know that the buzzer is, is dinging correctly. And secondly, uh, we would encourage new, new statements or issues being raised. Um, at the last meeting, we did hear a lot about um, you know, concern that there was negative feelings towards the hotel. Uh, which I think is definitely not at all the case. Council is, is merely looking at this issue because it is one of the few options that a municipality has for revenue. And as Patty mentioned, it does have some relevance to the ever increasing expenses that we see in the village. Um, so with that, uh, would anyone like to make any comments? Yes, Steve. Can you come up to the mic, please? Well, I think it should be evident to everybody in this whole community that the advent of the Hammond Hotel has been a tremendous benefit to everybody. And if you were to do an economic study of the rising prosperity of all the merchants, I think it could be traced to the advent of the Hammond Hotel. I dine there four times a, w a week. I've been doing that for some time. It's a lovely place, and I see a lot of people come. A lot of people are older, you know, who come there. And if the Hammond Hotel is taxed unduly. They will have to raise prices to meet those taxes, and that's going to affect their clientele. And in turn, if you, most of the people that come there are elderly for breakfast, a lot of them for events, older people who attend younger people's weddings and so forth. And it'll have, just as there's been a trickle-down effect from the prosperity of the hotel, if the hotel goes into decline, there will be a decline for other businesses. And I'm, I'm reminded also somehow of when I was a child and I began to read books and to have stories told me. And this is very reminiscent of the goose that laid the golden egg. And the people who in their greed decided to cut open the geese, the goose, and that was the end of the golden egg business. And I think that that is very applicable here. I think that the, the Hammond should be given as long a tax break as possible. For years, I saw Jim Hammond working till late hours, early hours, doing all sorts of things to prepare that hotel. I saw him running a bulldozer. I saw him digging dirt. It was just incredible. It was, just a, it was like one of the, you know, the, the labors that you read about in the Greek uh, myths about you know, the persons that turned the river or the, that fought the Stygian bull or whatever and the like. And I think that the Hammond should enjoy a tax break for a long time, um, simply because the good that they brought to this community 
and the good effect it's had on everybody else. I mean, every other merchant. I mean, it's, it's, I think, uh, incontrovertible that the hotel has been a blessing to every other business because people come and they shop. They shop at all the other places. They buy drugs at the drugstore. You know, they buy books, whatever. And as I say, if, if they are burdened with new taxes, ought to pass them on to consumers, and that will have an effect on the number of people who come here and their availability. You know, to, to put up money, it'll just have a chilling effect on them if they're taxed. I think the village should do all it can to to waive taxes, to postpone them. I, you know, Lord knows how long it'll take the Hammonds to, to recoup their costs. I mean, that's a big issue for them. And as I say, there is the issue of the little labor that the whole Hammond family has put into the realization of this dream. Thank you. I, I'd just you? like to be clear, this is not a tax on the hotel. This is a tax on, on the consumer, just like most hotels have. You pay the base amount, and then the county or the state or the municipality adds on an additional amount. So it's not well, a tax. It's not a tax on the hotel. We're well, I think whatever should be, whatever can be done to help the ham and save money on the hotel and to save taxes should be done. This state rakes in an enormous amount of money, some of it unfairly. For example, a lot of people are arrested and then their licenses are suspended, and then a roll is taken of those suspended licenses and the police are charged with watching out for suspended license. I'm sure they get a print on it. I'm sure it's not accidental that, that every week the Yellow Springs News has a little section about people caught driving on suspended licenses. I had the unfortunate experience of, of uh, going through the uh, Greene County court system some time ago, and the judge at the time um, read a memo to people who are present in the court, especially attorneys, about the amount of money the state of Ohio took in just on suspended licenses. It was phenomenal. And the judge who makes a lot of money himself, who sees the flow of a lot of money in the state, was astounded by this amount of money. And there, this, you know, as I've gotten older and had to pay more taxes, and I will have to pay more taxes in my house, you know, I, I, I hate to see people being actually bled for their hard work. And I think that, that that people should receive some sympathy and encouragement for the amount of devotion and hard work and energy they put into something and not be saddled with taxes, whatever the source of them. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? No, yes. Yes, but since you made another comment, I'd let like him respond. Dorothy? Yes, my name is Dorothy Bouquet, still. Uh, so I, I checked out just right now the pricing of a hotel bedrooms and, and that tells me that uh, it's a beautiful service that is open to people that are, uh, I would say, not primarily stretched by $4.50 that would be applied every day on a stay at the hotel. So I'm really, I'm really wondering what the burden is on the hotel business and at the same time, I'm actually a little bit more worried about the burden that is put on the residents of a village for taxes and I think that, you know, if I had to weigh between the burden of the guests and the burden of the residents living in the village that would like to see some relief in their taxes, I think that the person or the people that would benefit from them the most is or are the village residents. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you. Chrissy? I'm Chrissy Cruz. And I want to say that I'm kind of confused at why there's such a problem with this because the Hammonds are not the ones that are going to have to pay. It's going to come from their customers. If they raise their prices, then the tax is going to go up higher. So it's just going to, that, that's not going to work. And also, I, I really am not sold on this aspect that we were presented with at the last meeting about that Cedarville's hotel is cheaper and that we should try and keep our prices low so that more people stay here. Let's just face facts. We all admit that Yellow Springs, it's expensive to live here. It's expensive to shop here. Why shouldn't it be expensive to stay the night here? I don't, I, I don't understand 
My confusion also comes from hearing that they want to do big things for the community. Well, this is a tangible way that they can demonstrate helping out the community, and it doesn't come out of their pocket or even probably an hour of their time, and it comes from the consumer. And like Dorothy said, if you're paying $150 a night for a room, you're not going to change your mind because you have to pay $4.50 more in tax. That's just not going to happen. So I just want to see council being realistic about it. And the, like I said, it, Yellow Springs isn't cheap. We never strive for cheap, cheap in Yellow Springs. We strive for quality, and we charge for it. And so should it, yeah, everybody else that works here. So. <laughs> Thanks, Chrissy. Any other comments? Yes, Beverly. Becky Campbell. Becky. You call it a lodging tax. I call it tax without representation. The people that you're asking to pay this have, are not sitting here in this room. They're sitting at their home in Columbus or wherever. They're passing taxes with, the, with no opposition on the other side. You can make it 1%, 3%, or whatever. Look harder, and you'll find that directly or indirectly, Jim has already brought many dollars to this community. We don't need to make his life harder. I wrote these down. All Jim is asking for is a delay on lodging tax until the hotel gets established. He's not asking for a loan or a donation. He's asking for time and patience. Please give it to him. Thanks, Becky. Any other comments? Jim? Jim Hammond, Mills Park Hotel. Um, I don't think I can cover all this in three minutes, so I'll, I'll just have to write a letter to you guys and try to explain some of the stuff Patty addressed and some other things. But um, Well, first, we don't have enough information, really. I mean, you guys have actually had a year and a half to gather information on this, and we still don't know. So I'm not sure how we can really have a legitimate discussion. Um, the early discussion here was mainly on the impact that this tax would have on the count on the, the village, you know, the council and the village staff and what kind of work. You, you didn't address. I mean, you say it's not about the uh, it's not against the hotel, but you didn't address the impact on the business or or the the other lodging businesses in town. It's a big business. There's accounting. There is the impact on the guests. Um, a couple couple of you guys have mentioned. Um, that this is just a tax that's passed on to the consumer. Um, we don't call them consumers, they're customers, and it is not just passed on. The customer pays everything that has to do with the business. They pay all expenditures, taxes, labor, heat, electric, everything. So you go down the list and then you add the tax. The total is at the bottom. It includes the tax. It's all, and the customer looks at that bottom line, and, it's, and that's the total. So it does affect the customer and it affects the businesses. Ohio has tax holidays to generate business and people run out and buy a bunch of stuff so they don't have to pay sales tax. If it didn't matter, they wouldn't do that. If, if you had a choice between two hotels, one has tax and one doesn't and they're equivalent, you're not, you're going to go to the one that doesn't have the tax. It saves you a couple, a couple dollars. I mean, that's just common sense. So I think you need to Consider the impact on businesses and customers, because without the customer, we don't have a business. Thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, Lisa? Hi, my name is Lisa Goldberg. I'm just going to make a couple of very brief comments. First, I'd like to strongly urge Village Council to start this process by going to Greene County and asking for your 1% of their 3%, which you are legally permitted to do. There is no reason that you can't get 1% of the 3% that Jim is already paying to Greene County. All it takes is a municipality asking the county for that. That's 1% more in tax than you have now. Um, 
again, I would like to urge Village Council to postpone this discussion and give Jim a chance to get the business stronger and going. He has done nothing but help other local businesses of all kinds in this community. We help other new businesses come to this community, and yet we're not willing to help give him a chance to get his feet on the ground. Lastly, I would like to agree um, in principle with what Marianne, I believe it was Marianne, I apologize if I'm wrong, said that if this tax is going to be enacted, and I think this should all be done in one, um, one executive order, not multiple, but all establishments in Yellow Springs, and there are far more than half a dozen overnight stay places in Yellow Springs now. So it should not just be Mills Park, um, Morgan House, and Springs Motel. It should deeply affect the only income that Airbnbs and short-term stays provide to the community is income tax. They pay no other taxes. Jim is already paying a lot of taxes. Thank you. Thanks. Any other? Libby? My name's Libby Hammond, Mills Park Hotel. I just want to address and um, talk about what Judith said at the beginning when she was talking about the tax. It definitely is anti-Mills Park Hotel, whether you think so or not. And if you want to support us as a council, you will give us at least five years at least five years. All we want is your support. All we want is at least five years to get our feet on the ground. It's all we ask for is your help, your partnership, our village. We should be working together. Just give us five years. That's it. That's all I ask. Thank you. OK. Um, Council, any other comments at this point? Um, I would like to know what Lisa brought up. Have we, what have we, or have we found out about getting money from the county? What What have you found out? Um, <clears throat> the way that the um, the ORC is written is that. A municipality that does not have a municipal lodging tax is eligible to receive up to a third of what the county receives. So that could be a dollar and that could make good on the county's um, obligation or that could be up to a third of the 3%. Um, so it's currently being discussed in the prosecutor's office as to what um, this all means for Yellow Springs. So it sounds like, we, one, we don't know everything. Two, if we got the money from the county, then we wouldn't. You can only get the money from the county if you don't charge the tax. Is that That's correct? That's correct. Correct. And again, it's their discretion mm -hmm. um, as far as what they give us. It's not, they're not obliged to give us a third. It's up to a third, which is problematic. Um, they, they have not address this because the only other municipality was Cedarville and they never asked. So we, we've definitely been asking. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense? Everybody, all the other communities in Greene County have a lodging tax? Yes. And what, what is the percentage of the lodging tax? 3%. Okay. They I'd like to make a motion that we do a 3% lodging tax. I don't, I feel like if uh, we keep arguing about, I mean this to me, it's just dragging this discussion out doesn't make sense. <laughs> I guess I have to say that. And I'm with Mary Ann that we should include Airbnbs and all the lodging places in town. Uh, but we're going to have to figure out probably how to do that. But I, I would like to somehow move this conversation forward and not just keep, and keep going round and round. Um, I appreciate the Hammonds. I appreciate what Libby says. I. You know, I don't want to be this to be seen as counter to them, but I, like I say, I, I can't. I, I, everybody's got to pull their part here in this community, and I think uh, the hotel looks like it's really doing well. And I just, I just can't believe that that this little tax is going to uh, affect their uh, their success. And um, I think if there's any other ways, the village can 
show their support for all our businesses, including, you know, in particular, you know, the hotel, that's great. But uh, I don't think this is the way to do it. Right. So I've made a motion. Okay. Um, is there a second? <laughs> and does that motion, just so I'm clear, does yeah. that mean to sort of bring legislation to the meeting about this, or? Yeah, that's what it means. Okay, well I will second bringing legislation to the meeting uh, for a lodging tax. Okay. okay. Um, all those in favor? Well, is there any further discussion? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I don't like dragging it out either. Yeah, which just is dragging it out is, is, it, it is, is happening. Crazy I don't it. see this as being against the hotel. I can't believe it will negatively impact the hotel. I mean, I know a lot. I know a lot of people who travel, and they all say, "You always expect to pay taxes." At the same time, I do want to find out what we could get from the county, and I don't want to pass That's something true. unless we're clear who it's going to impact. And I don't want to create a more work and for the staff if we're charging every B, every uh, bet, every person that has a bedroom that rent, I mean that could be a nightmare. So I feel like I want more information and I also, if we pass a tax, I do, would want to start off at 1% not 3 so that's where I am. Okay. Jerry? And then Lisa? Well, since we have a motion on the table and You can discuss second, the motion. Then we vote. Well, after discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, there's <coughs> There's discussion, um, and the way I heard the motion is that we would have a lodging tax, okay? But along with that, then we're going to have to come up with, since it, this is Yellow Springs and we can <coughs> We can do our own. Well, there will be a lot more motions or uh, votes because we then have to define who we're going to apply it to because her, the motion just said lodging, <coughs> how we're going to implement it, okay. and, and so forth. So, um, <coughs> Could I, could I make a suggestion, please? Uh, Judith, potentially modify your motion uh, to say implement the tax pending the development of appropriate guidelines uh, developed by council and staff to show who this would affect and how it would be implemented. Because if you, if you were to pass this legislation in July and it would go into effect in August, we still would not have the appropriate guidelines of how we're going to handle this. So, Okay, I, I, well, I'll amend it to say uh, I'd like to move that we move forward uh, with a lodging tax, I'm saying, of 3%. Um, and, uh, and that we, you know, take the next steps so it's legislation won't come back to the next meeting, but that, you know, if council wants to move forward with the lodging tax of 3%, that we're going to go ahead and start figuring out what we need to figure out to finalize, uh, to finalize the legislation. Okay. Um, Lisa, go ahead, and I'll let you know. I mean, we've heard all the discussion. Okay. I don't think we should care. Okay. Two very quick points. One is no one is taking into account the fact that Mills Park Hotel is paying at least $107,000 a year in property tax. That is going a long way to help this village. Secondly, the name is the Mills Park Hotel, not Mills Hotel. Thirdly, I do not understand why Village Council feels the need all of a sudden to rush this through when many, many other things take months and months of discussion. Don't you think other accommodation places should have the chance to speak up if they're too going to be taxed? You do not have appropriate information to make such a decision. And in my opinion, it is completely irresponsible. And I'm sorry because I respect all of you as individuals, 
but I do not respect the fact that you are jumping to a conclusion and jumping ahead to just knock one more thing off your list. This is not the legislation, though. This is just a, a, a motion that we move forward in, in moving in that direction to develop legislation. So this is not the legislation. Well, that's what I'm saying. That doesn't mean that's where we'll end up. Okay. Well, I think, um, I mean, uh, w what is clear is that this discussion will continue based on the model, the draft legislation that we look at. Um, and so I think we need to Call vote on this. Yep. So all those in favor? You don't yes. have a second. Yes? You don't have a second. Brian, did you second? Brian did second. second. Yes. All right. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Nay. Nay. Okay. All right. All right. So what is that? I, I, I suggest we just move on. Yep. But I'd like to know, does it pass or not pass? It did not, it did not pass. And what does that mean? Uh, that it may be on the agenda again. So, um, but at this point, yeah, it's uh, it's not. Um, okay, so I think we need to bring Karen back in. Karen. Chrissy just had Karen. Oh, she heard. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. um, we've had staff reports. Oh, so uh, we do have this new piece of new business, best practices uh, regarding diverse work workforce. Judith, you brought it up. Um, what yeah. did you want to address? Well, I guess, um, you know, I had brought this uh, idea to our goals discussion that we develop a village. Um, look at I mean we don't have to develop it we don't have to create you know create a new thing there are uh, best practices out there for how you have and encourage a diverse workforce and maintain a diverse workforce and it's it's about hiring practices that you put certain practices into place and I wondered I, I'm thinking if, if this is something that council would adopt that we could then encourage uh, other other institutions in the village to also uh, follow such practices, and um, but I had handed out some information at that time, and I think I don't know. I think well, I think staff, staff is following staff up. Staff was going to look Patty, that, you, but I haven't heard anything back, so that's where I wanted to bring it back up. We actually already have in our personnel manual <laughs> that we will uh, hire and make specific attempts to hire. Um, women, minorities, persons of color. Um, but I think you know, that there are outreach. I mean, there, there are There's efforts. That, there are, but they're unfortunately different for each position. For instance, if I were going to hire a chief, um, I would look to um, the, associ the Association of Black Police of Chiefs of Police. Um, but I, I mean, they're rel relatively specific to um, positions and in general as far as um, labor positions or uh, lower supervisory positions I'm not really sure where you know what let, why don't we talk about it outside the meeting and maybe okay and we can bring something back okay okay, okay. thank you um, moving on to board and commission reports uh, Jerry Planning Commission uh, and it was I, the report from Denise. And yeah, I have nothing more to, to, to okay. add. Well, could you, could somebody review it since that was oh. one report that wasn't reviewed? Uh, where, where, uh, Here. Oh. You don't need to read it. Just, yeah. I mean, maybe the highlights. Well, <laughs> yeah, well yes, I do have a couple of things, things to say. No, number one, the, the small minor subdivision was, a, was approved for the split of the lot. The, the, the second one, uh, where we approve the uh, the food truck approval and 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 uh, the property on the, the King's house. There, there was quite a bit of discussion there, and and the discussion we did approve it, but the discussion did hinge around parking, and uh, there there are two issues. N number one, parking is is critical here in in Yellow Springs. 
Number two, uh, a lot of folks use Tom's parking lot as a public parking, and 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 that it's private parking. And uh, you know, I I I. I and, and what really concerns me after I heard Tom talk, the uh, Mills Park Hotel could run into that same situation where people now are thinking it's it's even though it's. A, private, it's public. Uh, so I think it behooves us as council to to look at some of the, the land that we own in the downtown area. And uh, we've got, got to come up with a way of providing more public parking. I so. would like Planning Commission to make a recommendation we, we don't aren't plan we we would be we would be more than happy to do I, that. <laughs> but, I, uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's something but, that's uh, been discussed yeah, off and on. And we'll, I'll, I, I'll I'll bring it up at the next well, meeting because I, we 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 have looked at some areas where we feel that could could and should become a parking area. So we can, we can do that and bring it back to council uh, very quickly. I was I was just going to say I I don't. I mean, I'm back to this has been an ongoing conversation for years. Um, I don't see a huge problem myself. So I don't know, do we want a direct planning commission to do that? I don't think it's a high priority. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't really know what they're working on. I mean, I think it would, it sounds like they think it's a priority. So that in some respects, if you know, we do direct our commissions to bring things to us that they think is Yeah, so that's why I said, shouldn't we have a conversation about it rather than just say, well, yeah, go ahead. I mean, maybe we should, if Jerry... Yeah, once we, once, once we bring you a recommendation, you, we, can, we can talk about it. But, uh, I mean, you, if know, it, it'll, it'll, you know, that, and I believe that's the job of the commission is to, to come up with it. We think well, I mean, I think the good. whole... Airbnb question that was brought some months back and you know I think we've been kind of waiting for that and I guess I would say I think that that's maybe a more important issue to that, hear that, from. Sh that should be and Judith uh, no. Judy correct me if I'm wrong we're, we're close to submitting that one I thought hey, I think that's coming back for discussion at the July meeting yeah yeah okay. to, council council or to, to, you know, to plan to plan to plan I mean I yeah. think that's the bigger yeah. priority but uh, we like I said the, the, the parking one I don't think that's going to take us down because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, we, we've already looked at some of this. okay um, Brian economic we've got your three Yes, Economic Sustainability Commission, we've already talked about June 28th here in Council Chambers from 7 to 9, um, the CBE community conversation. And uh, yes, and you were right. And uh, uh, for the Arts and Culture Commission, um, I, I think you might have noticed the kindness banners are back up. Uh, reminding us to be kind in, in a couple different uh, uh, aspects. And also the Arts and Culture Commission is meeting this month uh, on the third Wednesday at 5.30 here in Council Chambers, um, uh, looking at talking about uh, uh, the next Village Inspiration and Design Award. So, that's Great. It. Uh, Judith. Um, let's see. Energy Board, well, you heard from Patty about the M Empower is uh, reorganizing. Uh, so um, I guess they're expecting to be reorganized by the fall at some point. We may hear back from them. But I'm not sure that the Energy Board really knew where, where else to, to go to. Um, um, we did talk about, so I'm not sure where that next step is going to be. Um, the tree, uh, we are going to have um, Anna Belisari, am I saying her name right, mm -hmm. uh, come to our meeting in August, I think she's coming, uh, to talk about the idea of maybe trying to do a bigger tree planting. And then, um, you know, for shade and for the cooling effects, which is why the Energy Board would be involved. And I guess Environmental Commission may or may not also. Um, Justice System Task Force. Uh, we had a we had a discussion uh, on the mayor's court, the prosecutor, and integrating restorative justice practices. We had a conversation about that. Um, <coughs> Pat 
re reported on our police department's involvement with the Ohio Collaborative. People gave reports, so we're just sort of in the midst of work. Nothing. Okay. Uh, Marianne? Um, I didn't go to the last uh, mediation program meeting. I had a conflict, but I know that they are planning a 30-year celebration for the mediation program, and I was one of the people involved in getting it started. Great. And that's fun. Um, I met with Sean Crichton today, who's now the school board liaison to council. We talked about, I filled him in on things that the council is working on. He talked about their 2020 plan and the five sections of that, I think. We talked about a joint meeting and he is going to talk with the school board. Um, we tentatively talked about October 30th, which would be the first five month, five Monday month. Uh, and I w I, I'm going to talk with the township, too. Um, What's happening? What was the proposed uh, agenda? Well, we, would, we talked about creating a proposed uh, agenda. But I did, I talked, I, I mean, I talked to him about what we've talked about, you know? We're trying to get all the three groups so that we know what each other is doing, so that we can coordinate and not be stepping on each other. I talked about the issue of affordability. Um, so, um, the Environmental Commission is moving along on its projects. Um, the, the Climate Action Plan needs more assistance. We need more people working on it. Um, and so I, am, I would like to request that Council direct the Energy Board to work on the energy piece of the Climate Action Plan. I mean, that seems to me that it makes sense that the Energy Board take that on. And I'm going to be, or, or I and the uh, Environmental Commission, looking at other groups and, and individuals to take different pieces of the Climate Action Plan. So is that something that the Energy Board is willing? Are, were you aware of this request or potential um, request? Yeah, there's, yeah, we talked about it. <laughs> no, and, it, and Dewar came to our meeting, mm -hmm. and there was uh, tepid interest, but that's where uh, I think Marianne felt like council, if, if you know, yeah, that if council thought it was important, mm -hmm. since they're our yeah, commission, we could ask them to. Well, yeah. So that's, yes, I would. I, I support that. I, you know, I, I, the, I have been wanting some sort of a program, some sort of a, a energy incentive program for citizens. The kind of thing you were talking about, Judith, for years. And it's. I know it's not easy. I know it's complicated. But um, we just keep running into these into these roadblocks. Um, I'm not suggesting that the that the AMP one was necessarily the best program, but it was something, and we ditched it without something to replace it, and that was Energy Board's recommendation. So I would like Energy Board to um, to to get involved and and you know to take on this climate action plan, the energy piece of the climate action plan. I I guess my thought would be I'd like to see you know how. Energy Board, you know, could approach it. Um, I, I mean, I guess I feel like the, uh, you know, the um, cost savings. I don't know if that's tied directly into this work or not, or if that's different. That's different. Um, I, I would expect so. Um, so I, I guess it would be great if the Energy Board had a um, uh, a piece of this. That so would so fit. what it, what it involves for any of the pieces is. Um, setting goals in terms of particular actions. Mm -hmm. What we discovered is we can't really create a baseline of where we are on a lot of these things because we just don't have that information or it would be very costly to get it. But we can say, um, for example, energy. The Energy Board could uh, come to council and say we want to increase the amount of solar uh, energy that homeowners could get I mean or they might recommend that we put solar panels at our water uh, plant and have it run by solar I'm, I'm just making these things up but to create definite actions with uh, and that within a timeline of lowering 
uh, so is it, so are energy efficiency programs part of that could what be our climate action yeah, that plan? Could, that could okay. be I mean, as long as it is, that is that to me needs to right be the priority. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the environmental commission, we're we're continuing to work on the glass farm uh, grant uh, progress process. Um, I think, and so, oh, the Human Relations Commission, our last meeting we were missing three members and it was a short meeting and I don't think there's anything to report out of that. So I think I, I've made all my reports, okay? Green County Regional Planning at our last meeting we had a lovely presentation from uh, Mr. Brian Hausch on behalf of Rails to Trails Conservancy. And there definitely seems to be some interest and excitement within the townships to take advantage of bike trails and potential funding sources from Clean Ohio money. And so I think that um, Ken LeBlanc is definitely supportive of it. I think with having Brian as support and, and also Eric Oberg as support, I think that it might encourage um, a little bit more bike trail extensions into the township. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, honestly, I think we had like a 10 minute meeting. I drove to Dayton for a 10 minute meeting um, two days before street fair. So, um, and I don't remember what we talked about. Um, and the chamber, um, I said we have our business after hours um, this, uh, this uh, Thursday at, at uh, Stony Creek Garden Center. Um, we had a very successful street fair. I know that, that the nonprofits all did well from everything I understand. Businesses and, and vendors all did well. Um, so um, we're planning for October 14th. Um, future agenda items. Um, have we added anything? Um, so, oh, so June 28th is the forum, the, the CBE forum that's being planned by the Economic Sustainability Commission. So we are doing our meeting on July 3rd. Um, I guess for some people that might be a holiday, but not for us. Um, so we've got the resolution. We were provided with the information, the guidelines for village policing in our packet, so we'll have time to consider that. We have that resolution. Um, tax budget, that will probably take a little bit more of our time. Um, Safe routes to school grant. Uh, legislation. HRC will be here for their year-end report July 3rd. Mary Ann, July 3rd. Is Steve? I have no control. Okay. Can you ver I will kind verify of. that? Um, so oh. where did we leave things on, on lodging? Is there anything, is there anything that we put on the agenda? Uh, not at this point. Okay. okay. Yeah. And then you did you did want the Xenia Avenue project legislation for tap fees, right? And, and then don't we have a second reading? We have the sewer second. rates. Yeah. The what? Sewer rates. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the tax um, budget the place where we start? We start to really look. I know it's just a pro forma uh, process, but. Um, I guess there's some some parts of the budget that I think we should start thinking about early, maybe. Yeah, I have full projections for the end of this year and okay. what fund balances will look like going into 2018 and end of year projections for 2018 as well. So I will put that in a very easy to read one page um, projection sheet so that you guys can kind of take a look at that and start thinking about those things. Um, in a very easy to read format versus the format that the tax budget goes in, which is unfamiliar sometimes so I, I will provide some additional information for everyone to start thinking about the real budget and I will also provide a um, budget schedule for the 2018 budget okay for the meetings upcoming meetings terrific um, K Karen I, oh. I, I, I forgot there was one other thing that I should have mentioned that as it related to planning uh, there was at, at one of the uh, uh, areas that we're looking at a uh, concern did come up with uh, noise being generated from Mills work and mm -hmm. Denise has been working with uh, Brian and, and uh, Patty to, to see if we can uh, 
resolve that okay. issue. So. Okay, great. Is the, is the home recommend, recommendation, did you put That's the resolution, yeah, there's a resolution for that. Um, so it, it sounds like, then it's looking like July 17th, we have very little, but I assume that that, that uh, um, agenda here, will grow. In regard to the lodging tax, there were two things, I think. One, we need to find out from the county how and if we can get reimbursed from the tax that they take out. And two, um, staff, I'd want, like staff to be looking at if we charged other establishments, the small places around town, what kind of both headache and what value we would get and what headaches that it would create. Okay, so but is that so that's something that staff was directed is is do we have an agenda? I'm only concerned about the agenda piece. Is there is an agenda time been established for those, that? Those would be part of their reports. Yeah. yeah. So Melissa's already in process yeah, on the one. We, we have not tasked item. anybody with the other. So I'm sorry. second piece. Yeah, so uh, uh, Marianne was just saying that she would like to know um, what, uh, if a tax was in place, how it would be administered. And I don't know if I should say something because these are both topics about which I've recused myself. But it seems to me that the legislation related to zoning, related to Airbnbs, is tied into this. And if there's going to be tracking of Airbnbs for a zoning purpose. It doesn't seem like it would be that much of a stretch to track them for tax purposes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. That we, I think we need to get that, think about that before we start saying we're going to. I right. don't want to keep having discussions about it. I think a, a council member needs to bring a proposal. At some point, I mean, four, if, if people need me, more information, it, that's fine. That's yeah, fine. That's but then I think need. somebody needs to bring a proposal because we keep kind of having I mean, Marianne, long I, discussions, I, and it's just you might want to think about the next discussion and your involvement. Oh, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, and Chris, can I, you, mean maybe you might want to weigh in on that. Yeah. Can, can yeah. I suggest, yeah. I know Melissa's asked uh, several times to, to hold off a little bit for her to gather more information. Um, and it, there was an expectation that the discussion come back and that maybe that the not, that that discussion not return until Melissa's got full information to, to bring back to the table. I would call. Come on. No. That would be. I would like the opportunity to speak with Denise about how we would handle the the regulation and the and to Melissa about how the possible administration of that happened. Well, Marianne did ask for that information. Well, but so. that's we need to. That's coming from Planning Commission, isn't it? Isn't a recommendation to come from Planning Commission about that? Well, the staff is staff is going to have to find a way to internally um, keep track of what facilities there are and Melissa's going to have to figure out internally how she would collect that tax if it were if it were passed so but I think the first step is to the extent that we're going to that we're supposed to get a recommendation from Planning Commission to come back in terms of any sort of on the regulation air, on the Airbnb, on thing, the Airbnb yeah. On the, yeah. I, I think that it should be made clear that the only thing Planning Commission was charged with bringing back was a definition of short-term rentals. They, they are not at all, I don't believe, going to be in any way willing to weigh in on whether or not there should be any kind of taxation or how well, to Well, no, not track, taxation. How Absolutely to not. Establishments, they were truly, their purpose was, for safety purposes, someone to contact in the event of an emergency. That was there, and how to define short-term rental? Those no, but two. no, but but Matt and Denise and Brian and I met and had a conversation. At this point, I don't remember the detail, all the details of it. But my understanding was something was coming. It was going to go back to planning. Was it? Is that your idea? We, from what we had discussed with Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, Matt was could not make the last, the last meeting. So yeah. we'll I mean, it's been a while ago yeah. that we had so that conversation. It's been a couple yeah. months. 
if he may the chair what he fears is okay. again I'm not um, I'm not involved in either of these discussions because I've recused myself but I guess I would just suggest that everybody have their ducks in a row about all of those issues before they come back to council. I mean, it sounds like there's a real lack of clarity and um, it would be nice to have it figured out. Okay, sorry. Um, so next meet, so it looks like we don't have much for July 17th, so, but we've got a busy next meeting. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs>